We have Nancy in enough <laughs> to
good day.
Sally. Sally. Could I have a copy of that? Yes. I'll be able to sit down. Oh, wait a minute. When she sits down, we'll be able to get his chair out. I was going to say, you know, I don't think he's going to be able to get in. I don't mind sitting close to town. Y'all snuggle. Before the chair was like, I was going, don't have a hard time. I'm going to call this meeting to order. Welcome all of you here today to this meeting of the uh, Judiciary Non-Civil Committee. I want to begin very briefly by making some subcommittee assignments. And if you all want to take notes where I'm going to assign the following bills. House Bill 968 to Subcommittee 2, chaired by Representative Mumford. <coughs> House Bill 986 to Subcommittee 2, House Bill 1000, House Bill 1001, both to Subcommittee 1, chaired by Chairman Knox, House Bill 1029 to Subcommittee 2, chaired by Representative Mumford, House Bill 1032 to sub and 1043 to Subcommittee 1, chaired by Chairman Knox, and House Bill 1044 and House Bill 1054 <coughs> to Subcommittee 2, chaired by Representative and Vice Chairman Mumford. The only bill we have on the agenda for today is House Bill 1059. This is a bill that, as all of you know, has had a great deal of work and discussion. This committee started meeting last September uh, on this bill and had, uh, I think we've now had at least four, if not five meetings. I've sort of lost count, uh, but we have had a number of meetings and the bill has undergone uh, some revisions and the revisions have been made in response to concerns that have been expressed <coughs> by those of you who have been in attendance and who have submitted both oral and written comments and testimony. We have tried to uh, review all of that and digest all of that. Uh, the form that we have before us today is LC 292137S. Is that correct, Mr. Majority Leader? That's the one I have, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> what we're going to do today, I'm going to recognize the author of the bill, the Majority Leader of the House, Representative Keene to go through the bill. I'm then going to allow, uh, and I know he'll be assisted in that process by uh, Council Choate. Uh, I'm going to then allow the committee members to have a full and thorough examination of the author and council. <coughs> I know there are others here who uh, represent various points of view and interest. Many of you have uh, addressed this body before. Uh, if, if members of the committee wish to hear from anyone representing one of those points of view, then, then I will honor that request within reason, certainly. So with that, I recognize now the author of the bill, House Bill 1059, Representative uh, King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, 
ladies and gentlemen of the community, the first thing I want to do, <coughs> the guy that was coughing all the way through the judiciary speech was me, and I apologize. Um, I think my good friend, uh, Chairman Ralston, <coughs> gave me this, uh, I think they're calling it the capital crud that's going around, and I, I apologize. I'm trying to take antibiotics. I've got mints in my pocket and water, but it, when I talk, it gets worse, so I, I apologize in advance for that. Um, you have my full sympathy. Yeah. I'm glad you have it now. Not quite a year ago, I, like most of you, probably watched with almost disbelief as Jessica Lunsford was abducted, sexually molested by a repeat sexual offender, and buried alive even though this crime was committed in the state of Florida. It ended here in Georgia <clears throat> with the arrest of Mr. Cooey. As a result of that case and subsequent cases, too numerous to mention here today, even as recent as last week, <clears throat> I believe, like many members who have come to me, and more importantly, like the citizens who've come to me from all over the state, that we need to do everything that we can do as a state to ensure that those people who will prey on our children and rob them, if not of their life, but their innocence, um, deserve the harshest and the strongest punishment we can. In addition to that, we want to make sure that we keep them as best as we can from repeating that same offense. That began, that was the genesis of the bill before you. And that's the intent of the legislation. I want to first of all thank Chairman Ralston, who has been wonderful counsel to me. Uh, I'm looking at a room full of lawyers. I'm not an attorney. I respect what you do. My dad was a member of the law uh, bar for 52 years in the state. I have great respect for that field. And, Mr. Chairman, your patience with me, your counsel to me, and your help in crafting this draft that we have before us today, I want you to know I sincerely appreciate it. Uh, many others have helped to, to do this as well. Obviously, General Counsel to the Speaker, Mr. Cho. <coughs> Legislative Council, Ms. Travis, and others have, have been greatly helpful, and I'm sure many in this room around here have helped. Now, one of the things I've learned is that um, when you take on a, a subject matter of this magnitude, it is difficult, in fact, to please everyone. I've learned that the hard way. But I wanted you to hear the intent. I've listened to the changes up until yesterday, and then the last change was the speaker, who I think most of you know, who is a great friend of mine and who I not only personally admire, I respect his opinion, helped craft some of the final language. And I, with his experience, I yielded him. And I know he's here, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm going to yield my time to let the speaker. But I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you to all of you. And um, as soon as the speaker finishes, I'll be glad to continue. Okay. It's an honor for us to have a speaker with us today. Speaker, if you want to come around to the middle microphone and sure. maybe trade places with... Uh... Oh, this is fine. Okay. I, um, I know it's just a tad out of order for, for, for me to do this, but it's rare that I spend this much time reading legislation and working on it from start to finish. Um, but And I know you know the history of how this came about, but it started with the, the little girl Jessica Lunsford down in Florida last year was buried alive by what we now know to be was a known sexual predator had been released and uh, when that came up Jerry and I started talking <coughs> about what we could do in Georgia because we wanted to send the strongest signal that anybody had ever seen in this country no no child should ever be abused but my god buried alive after being molested um, there's not enough punishment that we can heap upon that person or anybody else that does that. And so we started looking at what we could do to send a strong signal. 
And we started looking all across the country to come up with what we thought would be one of, if not the strongest, set of laws to protect the children of Georgia from, from these people. We call them predators, child molesters, whatever you want to call them. And that's what this bill sets about to do, to put people in jail for a very, very long time for doing uh, deviant and, and heinous crimes and secondarily, if and when they get out, to monitor them long term. That's what the bill does. Now, I went through the latest version of this bill this weekend. And candidly, uh, some of you guys, I, let, let's, let's make sure we make this clear. I have defended people who have been charged with these offenses. I've been a lawyer for 21 years. And I read some of this, and I said some of this went a little too far. And it needed to be moderated because of the way references are to other sections and I met with my friend Jerry Keenan and said Jerry this is good work but boy some of this stuff <coughs> is too far because one of our jobs is to take care of the people of the state but it's to do it with moderation and to remember what we're doing so I asked him to make some changes and we looked at it carefully and those changes have now been made and I think the bill is now a better bill it is still a tough set of <coughs> rules and it is, it is still tough punishment for crimes that are out there. But if we're going to be strong on this, this is how to do it. And if we want to send a message across Georgia, this is how to do it and across this country. Uh, we are going to, I don't know if the, if the word stop is the right word. We're going to do our best to stop the heinous acts that are occurring across this country and if we don't stop them we're going to put you in jail for a long long time and uh, maybe just maybe we will protect a lot more of Georgia's children and that's what this bill does that's my spin on this I, if you start asking me questions about pages and lines I'll do my best uh, to answer those from a legal perspective but um uh, there's other lawyers that are much more capable than me to do this, and, and, and candidly, I don't practice much law anymore. <laughs> you guys know what I mean. And the longer you be, you're here, the, the less law you practice. But um, I feel like it's a good, strong bill. I'm sure that there's things that you can go through to make it better, and um, I'm here to simply say to you, I support this wholeheartedly. I, I hope this committee will. And I'm not down here telling you what to do. I, I, this, I don't... I'll be glad to engage in dialogue <coughs> to make this better. This is not a directive. This is me from my heart telling you, I think we need to do something. I think this goes a long way to doing it. I think this is a good proposal and good policy for this state to enact. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd be glad to answer any questions if you want me to. That would be up to you. We haven't really started going oh. through the bill yet. We were just in the introductory phase. And I'd like to sit here with y'all for about two or three hours and do that because yeah, I've sat in this room many times and taken these bills apart, and I suspect that's what y'all are about to do. I, I suspect you're right. <laughs> y'all just leave y'all leave it in some form that makes the statement that we need to make. But are there any general questions, Mr. Chairman? Is with, that with the permission of, of you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, and and, and Leader Keen. <laughs> Uh, we'll suspend here for a moment. If any members of the committee have a question of Speaker Richardson, I know his time is valuable. Mm -hmm. If he's inviting them, no uh, general question. No parliamentary inquiries. No parliamentary inquiries. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Mangum. Rep may, I, may I interrupt you? Would you, but don't forget to turn your microphone on before and then turn it off after you finish the question. Mr. Speaker, thank you for coming down, and uh, I certainly do appreciate your heart on what you just stated, and I agree with that, that whole sentiment. And I guess uh, one of the biggest concerns that I have personally had is that the bill seemed to be such a wide trap to encompass our youth. And given the socioeconomic data that I've seen, and I'm kind of alarmed at how sexually active our youth are now. And personally, I think I'm from the old school. I, I think you should just be absent until you get married. But that's the old, old school. But, but 
when our kids is is part of the intent of this bill I haven't really I just got the new bill is part of your intent also uh, if the kid if you have consenting young kids as the past legislation had is it your intent to also include them uh, because we had quite a bit of problem with SB 440 <laughs> kids going to jail for 10 years no possibility of anything and here we are and we know that kids are most sexually active at a certain age right now uh, and we would we would ask that they not be there but is it your intent to include those right now sexually active kids so that they would have a, a 25 year uh, confinement in the prisons of Georgia to cost us a bi I think it's a million dollars just to keep them in jail for 25 years. The answer is no. That's not our intent. Mr. Keene will speak to this. The bill has been perfected so as to exclude uh, people with a certain age ranges. I think that you're targeting 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds within three years. That is the intent of the bill it's not our intent to entrap teenagers or, or young people who are uh, think they're consenting amongst themselves it is our intention to make sure that when you get beyond that age range you get an 18 or 19 year old with a 13 year old that is not consensual action and, and, and we're gonna we have to draw the line somewhere but it was it's no one's intent and no one wants to capture teenagers who may have just uh, made an error in judgment rather than committed a crime. Chairman Bordeaux. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Keene, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate, first of all, you all taking the serious approach to this that you have <coughs> and introducing a bill or at least having hearings on, on the bill in the off season so that we could work through this. I appreciate you're willing to compromise on this. I've looked around the room, and, and frankly, at this table, I don't see anybody here who doesn't want to be tough on child molestation, who, who puts up with it with, for one moment. My mother used to say that they ought to be buried under the jail, and I believe it. I, I have this question, and it's not about any specific language in the bill. It's more of an approach. I've talked to some child advocates, people in, involved in child advocacy in Savannah, where, where I represent, about at least earlier versions of the bill. And it, 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 it's a question about the approach that we're having. In this legislation, we're coming down really, really hard on child molesters. We're sentencing them to a great deal of time in prison, trying to make it sure that they are tied up for life <coughs> in many instances. The ch some of the child advocates in Savannah have talked to me about this and said they are concerned about that approach in terms of making sure that child molesters get prosecuted and get imprisoned. Because it's, it's basically a weighing. And this isn't the only area where we have to weigh this. We have to weigh it in, in any instance where we've got mandatory minimums or raising the, the, the time in prison. Is it better to have X percent of the molesters imprisoned for a long period of time and let some go free because they're not going to be prosecuted? Or is it better to prosecute more and have them in prison for a shorter length of time? The reason I believe some of them won't be prosecuted under this is simply because if, if, if I'm a defendant in a case and I know that if I'm convicted I'm going away for life, I'm less likely to plead. So I'm more likely to insist upon a trial which especially in a child molested, molestation case where it is so traumatic. The, the trauma is, to the child is one of the reasons the penalty is so high, where oftentimes that trauma is increased because of going to trial. Sometimes the victim in a molestation case will not testify, and therefore there can be, be no prosecution. Or oftentimes there cannot, cannot be a prosecution. Sometimes the family of the victim won't allow them to testify. And I think there's the danger of increasing the lack of prosecution where the penalties are made so high. Could you address that? And, and I think it's a legitimate concern about this and some other bills. 
I, I think that's a I think it's a fair question. Anytime you increase the punishment for a crime, you risk defendants and frankly defense attorneys uh, instantly saying, "Well, you've made it so hard, we'll just try them all." I have uh, heard that through my legislative career for 10 years, and while it has occurred on occasion, I don't think that has been the rule because what our law enforcement has gotten better at prosecuting crimes and getting the evidence of, of people. I think that that has not proved to be correct, but if it does, I'm going to say <laughs> so be it. Uh, if they want a trial, they get a trial. They're entitled to one anyway. But here's what the balance is. The balance is when you've got these people, and from what I've read and the experts I've listened to is, is we're not rehabilitating people who are sexual molesters. People who molest children can't change. There was a program on this weekend, I think Mr. Keene probably referenced, where they talked to some uh, interview people, and they said, what will you do when you get out? Will you do it again? And the, and the convicted sexual molester said, yes, I will. And so since we know that, I think the trade-off is if a few cases that have to be tried aren't in exchange for we're keeping people in jail that we know are going to repeat this cycle, I think it's worth it because what's happening is is, is all the data suggests that, that these, these crimes start off as smaller crimes and build to the more heinous crimes to really abusing a child or burying them alive. And so... <laughs> We're going to punish them severely to start with, and we may not change them, but remember what else we're going to do. When they finally get out, we're going to monitor them. And, and I think that uh, this is a good solution, and it's a policy decision. Th this is one of those, Representative Bordeaux, that I can hear your position. I know there will be a few cases that don't want to be tried, and that's why Representative Keene, in another this final draft, and I'll let, has a... A, a, a one possible escape clause that will allow under some really limited circumstances if it's a first offense if they meet certain standards and if the victim consents that the judge can alter the sentence and probate it. It's one tiny exception to allow for those few cases where it comes up but it'll be a rarity. But there are cases, as you all know, where the victim doesn't want to testify. And if it's a first offense, the victim doesn't want to testify. And if the person meets the requirements, there's an escape clause put in there to let the judge suspend or stay or probate part of the sentence. It won't stay the, the monitoring provisions, but it will allow some relief. And I think that's a good trade-off for us doing what we're doing. And, and, and don't, let's don't make any mistake about this. The word needs to travel. This is the toughest sexual predator law in the United States of America. So if you're in earshot, if you hear this anywhere in Georgia, don't do it. Leave the state of Georgia because we're going to put you in jail for a long time. And I, I think we need to be clear on that message. And uh, that I hope I answer your question. It is a balance. It's a tough balance. There could be arguments made on both sides. In the end, I think this is the right course of action to take, notwithstanding what other people may say. We're the policy makers, and we decide if we're going to change policy in Georgia or not. I think it's time to change the policy. I appreciate your response. Thank you. Thank you. I know the speaker's time is limited. I'm going to take one more question, uh, <laughs> Representative Stucky Benfield. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank the majority leader and the speaker for being here. I know you did a lot of work on this very important bill. Welcome the speaker back to judiciary. You spent many hours in this room. Uh, I am um, I'm a little overwhelmed by the bill. We just got it, and it's 37 pages long, and it's, it's wide sweeping, and so um, I wish we'd had a little more time to review it, because um, I understand we'll probably take action on it today. Correct. Um, so I do have a couple questions. Uh, one of my concerns has been the first offender treatment. <coughs> I think in some cases of low-level offenses, first, treat, first offender treatment can be an appropriate sentence. And I'm not clear what's going on with the first offender in the new version. I was familiar with the early version. On page 34, I see on line 36, uh, first offender treatment is not allowed for sexual offense as such terms defined in Code Section 1710.6.2. I looked in the code and it's not there, and I see there's a new um, section created 
and that's referring to a level one risk, which is a low level offense risk, and a low recidivism risk, which uh, might be appropriate for first offender treatment. So uh, I, I have two questions. One is what was the um, rationale that went into uh, prohibiting first offender treatment, even in the low levels? And two, if, if there could be some explanation of the new levels that are being created, because this is a complete change from existing law to create these levels of um, risk for sex offenses. It's a, I, I'll, uh, I, well, I'll say, uh, I would say it was good to be back in judiciary. It's good to be back with the people on judiciary. Um, and I'll let, the, let Sam and Jerry answer the technical aspects, but, but let me tell you the logic. And, and don't, I, I don't want to get any credit. Jerry Keene has done the work on this. He just asked me to keep looking at different versions as they came in and different ideas. And uh, I don't know how many meetings there have been publicly, I think four or five, but privately there's been lots of meetings with prosecutors and people, uh, more than I can count, where I sat in and listened. Here's the policy. It is a policy decision this, this body, this committee, and then the body has to make. First offender treatment was designed to recognize that certain people might make a mistake and commit a crime and that we would wipe the slate clean. I'm sure it's worked in a lot of cases. And I don't know if there's a statistics on how it's worked, but here's what we do know about sexual offenses, especially involving children. Is there's not a chance that this is a first offense that's going to go away. These people have a, 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 a problem that they can't get over, and we as a state are not going to allow it to be swept under the rug, and we're not going to take a chance that somebody's going to take first offender treatment on offense involving uh, a, a sexual exploitation or uh, molestation of a child, and it's not going to be done. That is a policy decision. You have to decide if you want to do that or don't want to do that. I suggest to you, in light of the year 2006 and what we now know of people that tend to want to repeat, that it's a good time not to have first offender status for, for sexual crimes uh, as are set forth in this bill. There, there's that limited exception that allows for an escape, but it, I don't believe it allows for first offender. No, it does not. Probation. It, it allows a probation, but it would, it would be an adjudication. And uh, anyhow, I won't speak to the success of first offender. I, I, again, I know people that have pled uh, under first offender. They're, they're typically crimes where people made a mistake. And I, I just don't think these are mistake crimes. Sexual, sexual offenses against children are not mistake crimes. They're a, a, a sign of a very of a problem person that needs to be dealt with. And uh, that's what this bill does. Mr. Speaker, I said only one more, but would you take one from one of your committee chairs, Chairman Knox? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <coughs> I'd love to. Microphone, Chairman. Sorry. This is more of an observation than a question. And not necessarily to you, Mr. Speaker, but uh, one of the things that I'm, I hope that we will um, will be sure about in this bill, and I agree with you that this is we've, we've spent a good bit of time on this bill. I think this is a much better bill than it was when we started, uh, and I, that's no reflection on the author at all. It's simply that it's, this is a really difficult subject. Uh, there's a lot of code sections that we're looking at revising, and so uh, it's not an easy. It wasn't an easy matter at all, and I think. We're headed in the right direction with it. One of the things I, that I'm concerned about, however, is that I'm hoping that we have in here, that, that we're sure that we have in here some sort of a, uh, or that it admits anyhow, some sort of an operative type mechanism that helps us identify or that the bill will be able to identify and segregate uh, those of offenders, uh, and I'll call them sexual offenders as opposed to a sexual predator and I think there's a difference in those uh, there's a difference in the quality of the offender there's a difference in the factual uh, situations in the cases and I think there ought to be a difference in this in the punishment I'm not saying the bill doesn't I'm just saying as we go through this I think we need to be aware that 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 needs to be the case otherwise we're going to throw everybody into the same basket and you know there's you know there's some support for you know saying let's just kill them all and let God separate them out. But um, I'm not sure we want to do that. And, and when we're trying our best to come up with not only a, 
a tough law, but also one that's effective and speaks to the realities of the, of the factual situation that you often see. And the factual situation you often see is that um, that some of these, or a lot of these uh, offenses are by people who may not reoffend again. A uh, typical situation where it's in the family. Uh, and and I, I, I think the statistics show that those are not people are gonna re that are going to offend with strangers as we had in Florida where you have a sexual, a real sexual predator who <coughs> seeks out children that they're not related to and seeks to, uh, you know, do harm to those for his for their own uh, uh, ends, whatever they might be. So I'm hoping that we'll, we'll concentrate on, on trying to address that as we go through the, go through the discussion on this bill. And I guess I, the, the best uh, parallel to it, I think, that I can make with respect to this issue is the situation with a murder. And we all, you know, the popular view is that a murder is a murder is a murder, and a murder is, all, you know, more likely going to be somebody that kills somebody, you know, because they're mean, nasty people. And, and oftentimes what we find out is that the, the facts of the case are that a murder is done in the heat of the moment uh, a lot of the time, and uh, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't happen again. There are some people who will repeat that offense. So I think we need to be sure we're identifying those in, these, in this bill with respect to sexual offense as opposed to sexual predators who typically are people who are, you know, that's their main job in life is to go find somebody to satisfy themselves with. And so I hope that we'll concentrate on that uh, uh, because I think that's a real important thing for us to do for our benefit, for the benefit of the families that are involved in those prosecutions as well. well it, 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 I'll try to do my best to respond in that. But you, <coughs> but you, Chairman Knox, some people would argue that a sexual offender who would take such an act against a family member might in many ways be worse than one that takes upon a stranger because there's a degree of trust there implicit in that. And so I don't even want to start qualifying the difference. They're both heinous. But remember this, every sexual offender may not be a sexual predator, but they're a potential sexual predator. But certainly, for sure, every sexual predator was at once a sexual offender. And they don't start off being the predator. They start off with the smaller acts, and they get more and more brazen. Even if they're caught and when they're released, they get smarter about it and more heinous with it. And that's what this bill tries to recognize is this is a, a, a severe problem that needs to be handled severely. And unfortunately, there may be cases where the punishment is so extremely severe that someone doesn't want it and it doesn't seem to merit. But this is one of those situations that if we don't, the lack of punishment could result in creating a, a sexual predator. And that's what we're trying to protect our, our children from. And believe me, there, there's a side of me that reads this and go, boy, this is really tough. And if you've not read this before today, you, you need to read it. It is tough. It's going to put people in jail for 25 years for some serious crimes. I'll let Mr. Keene speak to the policy statement on, on, on some of those individual crimes. And with that, I'm going to leave you. I, I appreciate the, the work. I know that it's, it's hard to get through this, and I appreciate you going through this and doing a good job on it. We appreciate your being with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Continue. Thank Majority Leader King. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, just to follow up briefly on those comments, which not only do I appreciate, I understand, because we've been going through this. I, I want the members of this committee to understand, in, in, in spite of the speaker's kind words, it, there, there is no pride of authorship here. Uh, this was just an issue that candidly after the Jessica Lunsford case we had several members come and said what are we going to do how are we going to do this and, and, and so because of the tough nature of this type of bill uh, the speaker asked me to take it on and I did and um, I, I knew going in eyes wide open what I was getting into I knew the difficulty of the subject I knew all the special interest groups the advocacy groups I knew all, all the what was going to happen but I believe, as I think everyone in this room does, uh, that it's an issue we have to do something about. 
And sooner or later, as, as an elected body, we, we've got to make a policy statement, as the speaker said. And we may disagree on certain aspects of policy. But I think it's incumbent upon us to act. The citizens of this state and your district are waiting on us. And I, and I hope that we can do that. But my comment again to you is many of you have come to me and asked for certain uh, changes. I'm not an attorney. Uh, everybody knows that. And so I am open to, to that. We want to make this a good bill, but as the speaker says, we want to keep it tough. We want it to be the toughest. With that, uh, with your permission, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm going to go through the bill. Now, when, when the attorneys start questioning, I'm going to depend very heavily on counsel to ask, answer all those technical questions and where I can, if there's a policy issue and why we did that, I'll certainly chirp in uh, when, when uh, possible. Mr. Chairman, I don't come before judiciary very often, and that's not by accident. And um, so I, I, I don't know what the process <coughs> is here, but if you want to have me stop me on certain questions or go all the way through, that's discretion of, of the committee. Section 1 on page 2, if you'll go to page 2 of the bill. <coughs> Section 1 <coughs> or <coughs> really gives the legislative intent it's pretty self-forward, and, and it really just sort of restates what we've talked about for the last several minutes. The meat of the bill begins in Section 2, which goes through pages 3 to 5, which really determines aggravated assault with intent to rape. Uh, and what we're trying to do is determine aggravated circumstances as opposed to, Chairman Knox said, those that are, that are not. Um, it adds a new punishment for aggravated assault an attempt to rape a child under 14. This will see 25 to 50 years of incarceration and a mandatory minimum jail time for those who would attempt to rape a child under the age of 14. The offender will also be subject to the mandatory split sentencing provisions of a new code section 17-10-6.2. And again, I will let Council, if they're, Mr. Chairman, if there are questions on that section as we yeah. get through, is that the way you want to do why it? Don't we, why don't we do that? I think, <coughs> due to the length of the bill, um, uh, are you finished going through section? A two? Absolutely, and with that, we'll just we'll answer any questions we can. Questions from the committee, uh, Vice Chairman Lump. I have questions about this section. <coughs> it's my understanding that by adding J, you are creating a new offense of aggravated assault with intent to rape against a person under 14 years of age and setting up a different penalty than, Speech five. than existed uh, for just aggravated assault with intent to rape. Is that correct? And it's my understanding that this particular section does not have a Romeo and Juliet exception. On, on attempt to rape? On an aggravated assault with intent to rape. In other words, if the offender is is 15 years or 16 years old and is charged with this <coughs> offense under this this particular and by the way I didn't get this version until about 10 to 1 so I'm looking at the new version okay. but the you could have a, a, a 17 year old or a 16 year old charged under this um, this version um, and there is no Romeo and Juliet clause. Is that correct? Council. Uh, Representative, that is correct. The, uh, by, by the way, this provision has been in three prior uh, versions of the bill, so this is not something that just right. came out this afternoon. The, the, the thought is that addressing myself, if I can, to the questions Representative Mangrum brought up about consenting teenagers and tr not trying to cast a net so wide. Um, the, there are Romeo and Juliet provisions in the bill that take into consideration uh, the actions that teenagers will take between the, the ages of 14 and 18. However, it was the thought of the drafter that <clears throat> aggravated assault with intent to rape is neither a consensual nor an innocent crime. And I, I can only refer you to a, a conversation I had with a district attorney in Effingham County who called up and said, be sure and understand that we have 16 and 17 year old sexual predators in this state. So the thinking was that if a 16 or 17 year old 
is creating the crime of aggravated assault with intent to rape someone under the age of 14, that we have a problem on our hands that needs to be treated like a problem and not like a youthful indiscretion. And you, you considered the fact that aggravated assault could be committed without a weapon? Yes, sir, we did because that's the law currently. I would also point out that the punishment provision is subject to 1710-6.2. Now, <clears throat> there is a new provision in 1710-6.2 that the speaker alluded to. So if, for example, you had a 16 or 17-year-old who was charged and convicted of this particular crime, and that 16 or 17-year-old had no prior record and presented evidence that he was a level 1 or level 2, that is, a slight or moderate risk for recidivism, and the victim consented, then probation would be appropriate. However, due to the nature of the crime, that person would be subject to the sexual registry for the rest of their life. And they would also be subject if the victim did not consent. In other words, you're placing that decision is not in the hands of the judiciary or even a prosecuting attorney. It's in the hands of the victim to determine whether or not you're subject to 25 to 50 years in prison. I think the policy decision was that the victim should be a participant in that and that if the victim um, cooperates or doesn't cooperate, that that should be a mitigating or extenuating circumstance either to allow probation or to not allow probation. Uh, the, there seemed to be some sense from victim rights advocates that victims aren't always involved in these situations. So if we're going to create an exception for people who commit crimes like aggravated assault with intent to rape, then we want to make sure that the victim is a participant in the decision uh, on a, a one-time basis for someone who's not been a previous offender to be probated. Could you direct me to 1710 6.2 in the new bill? I haven't had a chance to look at that. I believe it is page 16. Well, it begins on the bottom of page 16 and goes over to 17. The provision I'm talking about is on page 18, beginning at line 5. <coughs> Does aggravated assault in this state require any injury to the victim? No, I don't believe it requires an injury. Assault generally does not require an injury. It differs from battery in that there's no touching required. And if you could direct me to this first offender, it's down there in 2 at 10. Is that where you're talking about? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm looking for the the, uh, the the minimum sentence or whatever you were talking about. The, there it is, 3 at 13, 13 <coughs> through 16 on page 18. Sub C, which begins on line 5, is the, the grant of the discretion to the court subject to three conditions preceding being met. Those are the defendant has no prior conviction. The thought being that if someone gets accused of a crime or gets caught, caught in a circumstance and they've never had that happen before, that maybe there's a doubt that you that the law might want to give them the benefit of. If someone's had the same, had been convicted of the same crime twice or even once, then especially con in crimes dealing with with this particular subject matter, the policy decision was not to give them, not to create a doubt and not to give them the benefit. So if, if there's been no prior offense and there's evidence that the offender would be a low risk of recidivism and the victim consents, then the court can probate which is what is otherwise a minimum mandatory sentence. Is there any other place in the Georgia Code where a victim is um, allowed to control um, this judicial function? There are some provisions dealing with the with the drug laws, I believe, where the where the victim has some some discretion. But I'm not <coughs> directly uh, I can't directly cite you to anything in the criminal. What, what, can you kind of give me an idea of what those provisions? Give me an idea I, of what I, that would be. I, I, I misspoke. Can't recall I, it. I, I misspoke. I'm I'm thinking about the defendant. You you said victim, and I'm thinking about the defendant. No. Right. I, I'm I'm, I'm no, concerned that I don't know of any other point in the Georgia Code where a victim uh, would. Uh, no, you're, you're correct, and the thought was that in these particular crimes, 
the victim is uniquely involved in, in, in what should be a punishment or what should be a probation. Unlike someone whose house is burglarized, you may or may not be particularly involved in whether someone goes to jail. But if you've been sexually assaulted or an aggravated assault with intent to rape has been committed against you, the, the, the thought from the drafters worth that, that, that that's the kind of situation where the victim needs to be involved. And the decision in this particular case would, of course, naturally be having to be made by a person under the age of 14? Or their parent. Uh, the code section we referred back to list who can be who can be the victim, and if it's, uh, if it's a victim minor, it could be the parent or guardian. We did address the issue of who that would be. Did you and address course, if there's a, pardon me, go ahead. I'm sorry, excuse me. Did you address if there's a difference of opinion between the parent and guardian and the victim? I don't think we did. Who would control? Well, the parent, the parent, I would assume that there would be either two parents or there would be a guardian or there would be a custodial parent. That's all right. Representative Mangum. With respect to your, again, of course, I guess we're all just saying this, and this is a very new body of law. <coughs> even though I am a lawyer, and I, I'm I, with great trepidation even hear how my colleagues feel because I don't practice criminal law, first of all. And uh, it's very new territory to hear some of the concepts that are being expounded. But for the example of a person uh, where, as I just heard, there is no touching. And if, for example, you have two, and I'll address this to both counsel and uh, Mr. King, I want to thank you for your hard work on this. And I, I feel your heart on this, but my concern is where I started, where you have no Romeo and Juliet accepted in a very touchy area here. If you have two 15-year-olds been dating two or three years, and I've seen literature saying the, 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 the sexual aggressor and abuser, the average age is 14, but say 15 years of age. If you have two 15-year-olds who they've been uh, having consensual sex, and they've been doing it for some time, and the young lady uh, finds out this guy is over there with her best friend, and she goes living. <coughs> and first of all, she didn't tell her parents that she was even having sex. But then she says, uh, he did assault me, or even if they got into a fight over this young lady, even if she was the aggressor, but then she says, well, he did this, this, and this, which would amount to aggravated assault. Is there an opportunity for the court to see through it? The court knows this young lady's lie four, four different times. The prosecutor saw her lie four different times. Isn't it justice to allow the judge or the prosecutor to also have a say in executing justice, where this young lady, she may regret it five years from now, or three years from now, or two years, or one year from now, <coughs> yeah, I lied on him, he really didn't do it to me. But he went over to Sally, and it hurt me so deeply that I just had to, you know, do what I did. But you are, my concern is, in that instance, are you intending to take away the duly elected judge, superior court judge elected by the whole circuit, and the prosecutor who makes their living trying to make a name locking away guys, but it's the prosecutor. We got some great prosecutors in there, I want you to know that. Who says, I know this young lady, lying through her teeth. I just called in three lies. But here she is, if she refuses to consent, are you saying that young man who's 15 years of age must go to jail for a minimum 25 years? Is that what you intend to do here today? In your example, your example was not covered by the code section. 
because this only applies to under 14. So it's only for children under 14, not to 15-year-olds, not a 15-year-old and a 14-year-old, not a 16 and 17-year-old. If they're engaged in, in what is currently called statutory rape, or if they're engaged in what is currently called sodomy, or if they're engaged in aggra what, what is now called aggravated child molestation, but the only aggravating circumstance is sodomy, and if the victim is 14, the perpetrator is no more than 17, or the victim is 15, the perpetrator is no more than 18, it is treated as a misdemeanor, they're not subject to the sexual offender registry, they're not subject to a minimum mandatory penalty. This only applies to 13-year-olds who are... Or under. Or under. Four, under 14-year-old <coughs> children against whom the crime of aggravated assault with intent to rape. The only thing we change in the law is to, is to increase the punishment if you commit this crime against a child under the age of 14. Now, <clears throat> with regard to the other parts of the question, we thought about this long and hard. We talked to defense lawyers, we talked to the prosecutors. I believe that in the case you just gave, the prosecutor would exercise his discretion and not prosecute for this crime. Mm. I also believe <clears throat> under 6.2, there could be a probation. But um, this this only applies to under 14. And I don't know where you stop it. it, it you have to be sort of arbitrary. But under 14 seemed to be a child. 14 and above seemed to be not an adult, but certainly heading toward adulthood. So that's that's the <coughs> theory behind the change in this particular concept. So, to be clear, so I, and that there is a, a slight difference there, but when you say two 13-year-olds who should not be having sex in the first place, but they are having sex, and the little 13-year-old girl says, he did it, are you <coughs> saying that someone who is not allowed by law to give consent, not just give <coughs> consent, Little 13-year-old kid. I mean, you're, you're telling me a 13-year-old kid is going to stay in jail for 25 years. Are you applying this to someone that's four years older than that 13-year-old? Is there a distinction between two 13-year-olds? Two 13-year-old kids. Are you saying that the 13-year-old kid will go to, and you've already labeled that person, and you already have scientific data to say, He's worthless, he cannot contribute to society. We're going to put this 13-year-old kid in jail for 25 years. I mean, God, I, it's more of a policy decision, I guess, but is that your intent? No, and I think that into the, in, if, you, if you drop below 14 and begin to talk about 13-year-olds, uh, we seem to hear from the prosecuting community and from the defense community that those, those sorts of um, Transactions are generally handled in the juvenile, and even if the di district attorney initially charges under a, a felony that would be handled by the superior court, defense attorneys would then move to have it transferred into the juvenile system. I, I suspect that's where that would be handled. But I also want to point out to you, once again, the district attorneys tell us tell us this: don't create in your mind the idea that someone who is 14 or 15 or 16 year old can't be a president, can't be sick, he can't do something that is destructive to the life of a 13, 14, or 15 year old. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your indulgence, but I just want to just, so your answer is yes. A 13 year old who is accused by another 13 year old of aggravated assault will go to jail <coughs> for 25 years and will not have the possibility of less than that unless the 13-year-old or the parent agrees that they should not be in jail for 25 years. Request. Is that what you're trying if, to do? If he's convicted of the crime and it's not handled in juvenile court, yes. But I, but that's what this is yes. for. Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Right. There are a number of <coughs> members of the committee that won't ask questions, and I think the order I have is Representative Bearden for a short question, and then Chairman Knox. <coughs> this is going to 
council up. I was just going to point this out. And I believe it's <coughs> under page 7, code section D, line 15. It's pretty much covering this area that we've been discussing about the victim. I'm talking about being under, a, correct me if I'm wrong, if the victim is 13 or un, younger, or the victim is 14 or 15, there's three years difference, and it's only a misdemeanor. Because we've heard a couple of times 15, 15, 25 <coughs> years, that area. I just want to kind of point that out. Different. Isn't that the area that we're being covered under? Yes. And the main point of this is 16, 17, aggravated assault or raping a child under 14. That's what we're looking at on the sentence on the 25 years. The, the, the increase in the penalty <coughs> is a recognition of victims who are under the age of 14. When the perpetrator is under the age of 14, those are generally, if not exclusively, handled in the juvenile system. And if it's handled in the juvenile system, then they wouldn't be subject to the penalties, nor would they be subject to the registration requirements. And the new registration law specifically excludes any juvenile action that is taken or if a case is transferred to juvenile. What you're pointing out to is something that is, that is new to the code and a recognition of the issue that Representative Mangrum brought up, and that is that heretofore the only code section that has uh, provided what we call a Romeo and Juliet exception has been statutory rape. This bill extends that to sodomy and in some cases um, aggravated child molestation and child molestation where those acts occur between teenagers in a consensual environment. Um, so there's been an effort to recognize that, 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 that those are different than actions against children under the age of 14. And that's why I just want to point out, because I've heard twice in the Romeo Juliet clause, and it's actually in here, and if there are two kids making a mistake, then it's taken care of under a misdemeanor, but if we got a child being raped, it, it, then we got the 25 years where it should be. Yes, sir, that's right. Thank you. We, we think so. Chairman Knox, and I'm, I know people are raising their hands, so I'm just writing you down in order, so Chairman Knox was next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't I'm not going to address that particular code provision, but I'm concerned about the issue of the victim having veto power in connection with the sentencing. And I know it's, you know, uh, victims' witnesses' statements have been around for a while, but even in jury trials, it's in Georgia, it's <coughs> exclusively within the purview of the judge that sentencing is imposed. He has the only, he's the only one who has authority to impose a sentence. I'm wondering if there's a problem with having the victim uh, have some veto power over whether the what sentence the judge imposes. Am I, am I misunderstanding this? Well, in answer to the <coughs> question that Representative Mumford asked that I didn't have the answer on the tip of my tongue, I, I apologize. Currently, victims have the right to express an opinion um, with regard to the sentence negotiations or participation in pretrial or post-conviction diversion programs. That, that's in 17711 of the code. Uh, I, I think there was a thought <coughs> that with regard to a, a sexual crime, that <coughs> if in fact um, the system has caught someone up who perhaps needs some consideration that in those circumstances the victim is more likely to cooperate and the only way to know whether the victim is cooperating or whether the victim, victim is being coerced and left out of the process by the prosecuting attorneys is to make the victim an integral part of the process so that if the victim has in fact been victim <coughs> and in fact does not want this person to be probated then the victim ought to be able to say that the only, the only disadvantage to that is that the state has to prove a case, his case and the defendant gets to present his defense. But if it is a situation where leniency or, or, or some additional consideration on the part of the court is required, that these are crimes where the victim is uniquely a part of the process and should be a part of that determination. We already have a victim's, a victim's impact statement, though, that the judge can take into consideration as part of his sentencing. But I think that's a different char character of involvement by the witness than this is. I, and if you could help me with this, I, I'm not sure exactly where that is, where we put that in this section about the victim having the 
that the that the sentence can be imposed with the consent it's of the on victim. Page 18. Okay, I, I was looking for it and I lost it after I started. Uh, where where is that in it's the on line 13? Line 13. Okay. It's a part of subsection C of New 17-10-6.2, and these are essentially <laughs> conditions preceding. Okay, well I I, I see that and. And I understand what the I understand what the thinking is and what the 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 intent, what the intent is, but I'm still thinking that if the if the victim has whether it's for good or for ill, I mean you know it could be for leniency that the victim says no judge I don't want you to give him 25 years, or no judge I don't want you to give him any probation. Uh, it sounds to me like in this uh, that what we're saying here is that the the consent of the victim is required for the judge to enter. Or to grant either one of those conditions, whichever they might be. Yes. Am, I, am I correct about yes. that? Okay. And I'm not sure how you do that constitutionally. I, I, I just don't think you can do that on, on, in Georgia under the current scheme of the judge being the sole authority as far as sentencing is concerned. I mean, he has to follow whatever the law is with respect to the sentences that he can impose, but that's a different matter than whether a person who's not a judge and not... I mean, you just got to be a judge to impose a sentence. The prosecutor can't do that. The prosecutor say, I'd like for you to give him, you know, 150 years, judge. But the judge is the one that gets to decide that. He doesn't have to have the consent of the prosecutor or the defendant or the defense attorney or the sheriff or anybody else. And so this is something new, I think, that we've got in here that I think is could be could be a problem. I, you know, maybe ledge counsel's got an insight in it that I don't, with I'm all, missing. But. With all due respect, I, I've worked with ledge counsel on this particular issue. And about the time that the Constitution was amended, when the seven deadly sins were put in, because as you know, there is no discretion to probate in the seven deadly sins. About the time the legislature was creating that constitutional amendment and it was passing, the Supreme Court also dealt with the issue. And the Supreme Court said unequivocally that the determination of punishment is for the legislature. It's not for the judges. The judges do what the legislature tell them to do with regard to punishment. Now, there has been another Supreme Court case that has dealt with the issue of whether or not a, um, you could create a unilateral right to move for uh, probation on the part of the, the DA. An earlier draft of this bill, we had that in, that the, di that the district attorney with the consent of the victim could do that. And the court basically said, if you create conditions preceding <coughs> to 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 probation where probation might not otherwise exist and this came up in the context and this is what I was thinking about when representative Mumford asked it came up in the context of where a defendant wants to help the DA in a drug case there's a provision that if you do that then the court can take that then the DA the law actually says the DA can then at its discretion ask the judge to to modify the sentence and the Supreme Court said if you're going to create a condition then anybody can move the judge. It doesn't, it's not fair to let a defendant come forward and then not be able to move it. So what we did was come in here, create the conditions preceding. The DA can move for probation. The defendant can move for, for probation. Under a certain circumstance, the court can do it sua sponte if it met these requirements. So we, we have, in fact, looked at what the Supreme Court has said about the constitutionality and who can impose and what the legislature's ability to restrict the, the ability of judges to sentence or to probate. So I think we've looked at those issues, and I think this would pass scrutiny. At least let me say that it's been crafted in such a way that we hope it would pass scrutiny. But we have thought about that issue. Chairman Cooper with Chairman Bordeaux on deck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Leader, I mean, and what's just been discussed, it seems like a simple solution to that would be if you, if you could take into consideration the victim's wishes on it but as one part or the judge could be involved in it or something like that but what i have questions about is d it's and i appreciate the fact that y'all have put in this for those rare cases where there seems to need to be some consideration about what has happened but recently there was also a program on television a florida case where there was a sexual relationship between um, a gentleman and a young lady, and the young lady had lied about her age, got mad just like something happened, and then revealed her real age to her father and so forth. And the man went away, admitted that he had had 
sex with her, and he continued after he had found out how old she was. <coughs> but then showed up on the sexual offender registry forever and said that you know, he couldn't get a job. He was thinking about leaving the United States because it had totally ruined his life forever. So I'm curious about the fact we seem to be giving people a chance here, and I appreciate that, but then by putting them on the sexual offenders registry forever, it, it seems to take away that chance. And by marking them for life. And I was wondering the thinking behind that or the So I, I, I'm not sure of the circumstance you're talking about for Well, but so I mean I, it's I, not I what I'm saying is if is you're that talking about a twenty one year old and a thirteen year old or something or something of that nature. But let, let me let me speak to the policy issue. Because sooner or later you and, and I'm not is that me? Or, What I've struggled with, because I know I'm an old man, but I'm not that old, uh, is I don't want to do anything that would take what I think most of us in this room would, would take as immature children and teenagers and consensual activity between them and lump that with the people we're trying to trap. I, I said that day one when we started this process. But to craft language that also allows for the prosecution of these people who start out and who will continue to harm our children. This is a very difficult thing, as I've learned. But, but I think what we have to do sooner or later is understand that whether we govern by exception or rule. And I have, I've asked counsel, legislative counsel, <laughs> the speaker, Chairman Ralston, to help me in that. How, how do we craft and get around that? And that's what you see in front of you, sort of mm -hmm. a cumulative act. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, to, to your instance of a, if it's a 25-year-old or a 13-year-old, I'm, I'm going to tell you, and, and maybe you and I disagree on this, I consider that criminal behavior. No, we don't disagree, and, Mr. Leader. And, 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 and so I would say, you know, it, we live in another era. I think Representative Mango pointed out, I think correctly, there is considerably more sexual activity among our youth than there was certainly a long time ago when I was considered a youth. And <clears throat> I would hope that those who are considered adults, given the fact that we live in that today, need to be very careful. And if um, if you understand what I'm saying, tact, I'm, I'm trying to say tactful, but I would, I, would, I would caution them to be very, very careful in their activity uh, but, but that's why we put the under the age of 14, a person that is 13 years old or 12 years old, to me it's, and this is me, is different than two 15-year-olds, a 16-year-old, 17-year-old, but engaging in that same activity. Mr. Leader, apparently I used a bad example, and I'll take that responsibility. Mr. Cho, can we look on page 18 and look at what we're talking in the sessions on, we're discussing lines 8 through 13 and that provision that the speaker also talked about that we put that one exception in to be used in cases where we think, how, how do I say <coughs> that there is room to be, that maybe that person needs an extra chance, that it's circumstances that don't meet the other standard. And all I'm asking is, if we put that one except, this exception in to be used in those very special cases, it seems that but that by putting D in, also that we sort of give them partial exception to it, but then by putting them on the sexual offender registry for the rest of their lives, we take most of it away. And well, let me, Re representative, let me address that issue because um, <coughs> one of the one of the recent events in metropolitan Atlanta. That, that is directly on point is the case of a gentleman by the name of Clark who kidnapped um, a young woman, the mother of two children under the age of five, um, abducted her at gunpoint, took her, drove her SUV, was in a crash, she was killed. The defendant was Clark, but the young lady was Boyd. 
um, Mr. Boyd was on the sexual review. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Clark was registered as a sex <coughs> offender in what we think was um, a, an inadequate registration that's corrected by this particular bill. But he was also on probation for statutory rape. When he was 21 years old, he had sexual relations with his 15-year-old stepsister. And that's exactly the kind of situation that we hear psychologists and professionals talk about time and time and time again. What we want to call an innocent situation is really a precursor or a red flag and a warning. And that's just a current example. There are all sorts of examples. Now, under our bill, when Mr. Clark, when Mr. Clark had been, because he was 21 and he had had sex with a 15 year old, under our bill, the day that Ms. Boyd was kidnapped and killed, Mr. Clark would have been in jail. And that's where he should have been. So I guess the policy decision and the message is, if you're 21 years or older, and you're gonna, you meet someone you don't know and they look young, you really do need to be sure of what their age, are, age is. Because, because if we take a chance, we're taking a chance with, with someone's wife who's filling up with gas, as Ms. Boyd was. We're missing the whole. I thought that he would have never. I certainly would have wanted him to get certain worse punishment. I thought we were talking in this section and what the speaker said about special cases when it didn't, when they didn't seem to be people like him. But well, you get you get probated. This section allows you to get probated and not serve the minimum prison term. But if you're convicted of a sexual offense that's listed in the prior part of the section. The policy is that you should be on the sexual offense registry because we don't know when the mood's going to grab you again, so to speak. We can't predict. And, and something that appears innocent in this context, we've learned, can be a precursor for something much more dangerous and much more horrific. So we're going to keep track of folks. And, if, and, if, and yes, it is an inconvenience, I would guess, to be on the sexual offense registry, but it's much, le it's much more inconvenient for a sheriff to have to go and tell <coughs> tell someone that their wife's been murdered by someone who probably should have been in jail. That's the policy. That's where it came from. This allows a first offender who's got a low risk of recidivism when the victim consents to be probated, but not to be off the sexual registry and not to be evaluated because they, they need to be evaluated. The person who looks innocent may turn out on evaluation to be a predator. Okay. I just want to make it clear. I guess I misunderstood what the speaker was saying about the one exception. I have a master's degree in psychiatric nursing. If they are true sexual offenders, Mr. Leader and Mr. Cho, I basically don't care what you do with them. I thought that what the speaker was referring to was that this was being put in just because some of our fears and people in this committee that are lawyers and much more learned about the law than I am and people that have expressed it, for that rare instance when it seems that there might be somebody lying in the case and, there, and younger people and so forth, is that possible safety net. That's what I was asking the question about, not any other part of how we deal with true sexual predators. The, 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 the one thing that we might be getting confused here is where we've, where we've put the um, Romeo and Juliet exception for children in, they won't be on, on the registry. They're off of it. So I'm sorry if there was a misunderstanding there. But, but, but what the speaker was addressing, and, and he said it, but he said it quickly, is just probation. But if you're convicted of one of the offenses, and the offenses are listed, and they're pretty, they're, they're pretty serious offenses, you'll be on the registry, but you might be probated. So I apologize for the misunderstanding. Then, then help you. Chairman Bordeaux to be followed by Representative Sutzner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to be brief. I just have a couple of quick questions, I think. Um, could you all refer to page 5, the new language at the top there, line 6 through 9? When we're talking about aggravated assault with intent to rape, is that only with intent to rape, or is that would that also include intent to commit <laughs> statutory rape? 
and I'm not trying to, we are trying to draw fine legal distinctions here, but well, I th go ahead. Yeah. <coughs> assault is a tort or a crime of intent, right? Statutory rape is a crime of consent, but because of the age of the consenting, <laughs> Which I guess should be in quotes. Then it then there is a, is deemed a punishment. So so I think that's the that no the answer is no I don't think because this is a, this requires intent mens rea and and statutory rape requires no intent. It's simply a, a statutory per se violation. All right, and, and that answers. So, so to come under subsection J there, there will still have to be the the elements of. Rape, which would be to yes, sir. take someone forcibly yes, against their will. Yes, sir. That's, that's, that's okay. yes, sir. That's yes, what sir. I want. Then, and, and we've gotten over into page 18 with the, this issue of what, what Speaker Richardson brought up of, in effect, some type of first offender. And I'm concerned, of, as some of the other members of this committee have expressed, about the victim consenting. And I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves because we were supposed to be discussing aggravated assault, but if I'm a criminal defendant, is there anything in this which prevents me from paying my victim to consent to me not going to uh, prison for 25 years? I, I don't know that there's anything in this particular bill that would prohibit that. Then. For me to stay out of prison for, I guess, the 25 years minimum mandatory, mandatory minimum that was talked about here, to get the victim to consent, I could pay her $10,000 or pay her whatever it might need be. She could give her consent. I could buy her off, in effect, and it'd be perfectly legal. Theoretically. But, but, but can legally. I ask a question? On, isn't that true of just about any criminal charge? I mean, if I'm charged with uh, robbery or... Murder or something. I could, if, if somehow I could circumvent the process and get to a victim and say, "I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll, I'll give you." Isn't that possible today? It, the crime is committed whether or not the the, the victim consents to prosecute or not. <coughs> right. The issue here is this bill, this version of it anyway, carves out something that is evidently unique in Georgia law and as far as I know any other law that says that. The victim holds the trump card in terms of whether these very draconian sentences are imposed. And uh, to me, that and it, it may it may be if you want it to be public policy that yes, you can pay a victim to give that consent. But, but, may I interject? A, yes, sir. Would the victim not at that point, not prior to the consent, not be a <coughs> witness and I'm going to ask the district attorney back there and, and and if I'm in Douglas County and if I make that offer of payment what you going to do to me for what but but at this stage and maybe we're talking about different stages still a witness what if she finds it? Mr. But, but it's, a, it's a question of, and I'm not trying to argue, I'm, I'm asking. No, I, can I, can yes, I suggest an answer? <coughs> um, this particular provision comes into effect after conviction. Mm -hmm. However, we believe that it will be an effective tool for prosecutors and victims to work together to plea bargain in these situations. <coughs> I would suggest to you that if someone has already been convicted of a, one of these particular crimes, that at that point in time the victim may or may not want to. If the victim has been forced to go through the process, maybe the victim won't. Maybe the victim will if the conviction has stood up. But what this is, one of the, one of the salutary intentions of this particular provision was that the victim and the prosecutor would have the ability to work in plea negotiations, something that appeared in prior drafts of the bill not to be available because there was no probation suggested. Remember, the original draft of the bill said once you're convicted, there's a minimum mandatory, the judge has no <coughs> discretion, and I think constitutionally you can do that. The idea here was to create an ability 
for a first time offender, someone who who was who could prove themselves to be low level risk with the consent of the victim to enter into a negotiation because without that you couldn't enter a plea and suggest to the court and have the court have the ability to probate. So this is this is as much a plea negotiation tool as it is anything else. After it, it, it technically only comes into play after there's been a plea or a conviction. How is it all right for the prosecutor to work with the victim <coughs> as to what she's going to consent to or not, but it's not all right for the defendant? I, I think it is all right for the defendant. The district attorney out here suggested that bribing the defendant might not be appropriate, but certainly going to the defendant and working with the, the defendant victim. and talking of the victim. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think that's that. We, we certainly see that as a possibility especially if, if they know each other, especially in a situation where it's innocent. Because what we're trying to do is create an ability for the system to recognize at, at the prosecuting level that there might be extenuating circumstances and victims might want to cooperate. But if victims don't want to cooperate, then we don't want there to be this. So that's kind of the... Okay. One last question if I may, Mr. Chairman. Um, there has been stated from that side of the table several times now already about um, the sexual, I'm not sure how we're dividing it between sexual offender and sexual predator, but that the <laughs> sexual offender is reportedly always on the road toward being a se sexual predator. And I recognize your legal expertise, but I share some of the concerns um, Chairman Cooper <coughs> expressed a moment ago. Has there been testimony at the earlier hearings? I was in Savannah for those hearings, I confess. But has there been testimony that that's always the case? If I might, the, the testimony that we've heard and the research we've done doesn't suggest that every sexual offender is or will be a sexual predator. What it suggests is we don't have any way of knowing except by evaluating. So what the bill contains is um, a ramping up of responsibility on the sexual review board. Currently. Everyone convicted of a serious sexual offense is not reviewed by a board in Georgia. You're only reviewed if the Superior Court judge requests it. It seemed that the better policy was people convicted of a certain list of sort of dangerous things. That would not include statutory rape. It wouldn't include what maybe we can call statutory sodomy now. I don't know. But uh, those sorts of misdemeanors or consenting uh, teenagers. But if you're convicted of... of uh, aggravated child molestation or enticing a child for indecent purposes or kidnapping a child under the age of 13, you're going to be reviewed by the board and the board is going to determine whether you have a low or moderate risk for recidivism or whether they think you're a predator, which means you have a high risk of committing a similar crime again in the future. We don't think that, I, I mean, I, we believe based on the research we've done, and House Research has done an awful lot and we in our office have done a lot that the only way to make even that educated guess is to have everyone who's shown a tendency to commit this sort of antisocial behavior evaluated by professionals. So that's what, and, and, and that again is why we, we, we don't exclude that from the, even when we'll moderate the sentence with a potential probation, we aren't going to let them escape from the review process because we think that would be irresponsible. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Rep uh, Representative Setzler and then Vice Chairman Mumford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, get, uh, Jordan Luther King, I, I, I very much appreciate you bringing the bill. I think um, this is a, an important statement. It's a leadership statement to make from Georgia. And I know your concern has been all along that we not have any intended consequences in this bill. And that's that's what, I, what I think I hear the board, what, what I hear the committee addressing, kind of going through make sure there's no things that can slip through the cracks. What I want to get a feel for, trying to stay on Section 2 and kind of go point by point through this, uh, being a non-attorney, I confess, um, as I read back in the beginning of the section, uh, looking at the different elements of aggravated assault with intent to rape, I'd like if we could just maybe open the process up a little bit of, among the committee and discuss a sort of target case. What does aggravated assault with, with attempt to rape typically look like? And what might a borderline case be where it might be... <coughs> less aggravated or the, the, the classic borderline case that's always thrown in your face, hey, this, this shouldn't have, here's what the person did, they shouldn't have gotten the 25 years because it doesn't seem to fit, the penalty doesn't seem to fit the crime. If we could just kind of discuss 
some examples of kind of what the target is and what a borderline might be to just understand. And, and Mr. Chairman, I asked that question, and I would, could address it to Representative Keener or to Council, because I do understand that you know, salt doesn't require touch in Georgia. I just want a wiser legal minds than mine to kind of outline what this might look like. Well, Representative, I have no personal experience, um, but um, the, the crime of assault with intent to rape, I would suggest, would in, and we're talking about under the age of 13, mm -hmm. would involve someone who uh, makes, makes a 13-year-old believe and in fear that he is going to have sexual relations with her against her will. Against her will. And I would suggest to you that, that a person who would do that is, um, needs to be convicted, needs to be sentenced to a minimum mandatory of 25 years, needs to be evaluated by the Sexual Review Board because that is deviant behavior. Yeah, I hear loud and clear, Council. I don't, I don't doubt. Um, and I don't dispute it's a deviant behavior. I don't dispute it's a felony offense. I'm just, just asking just for some discussion among the committee. You know, we're talking about a legitimate, credible threat, no contact, um, a threat nonetheless, and a threat to rape. And I'm, I'm not disputing any of that. I'm just, just trying to think through in my mind as we look at some of the aggravating offenses that I think clearly need to get 25-year mandatory minimum. Does this, as we kind of stratify in our minds the most heinous, almost most heinous, and kind of work down. I mean, is, this, is, is this in step with the other provisions of the bill? Well, we currently have offenders incarcerated for assault with intent to rape. I, I guess some of the sheriffs here might be able to tell us about some of the facts, although they might want, not want to talk about it you know, in, in public. But let me say this. We aren't changing the law with regard to assault with intent to rape at all. We are simply suggesting that when that happens to a 13-year-old child, it should be treated differently in terms of punishment. That's all we're changing. We're not changing the law with regard to aggravated assault with intent to rape. Hey, Council, I don't, I, I know we're not. I just, it, the, the question I have is, you know, as I look, if it's assault with attempt to rape with an adult, I believe it's, is it no less than one, no more than 20? Yes, sir, that's correct. And again, I'm just asking the question the committee is going from 1 to 20 for a 14-year-old trigger 25 to 50 for a 13-year-old. Just, and, and I like some discussion on that. I just, I'm not sure I've worked through that yet. Well, where would you draw the line? I, I think that's open for discussion. I, I don't know. Well, I mean, 12? No, it's, it's not an age thing here. It's just, it's just a, we're going from 1 to 20 at 14 to 25 to 50 at 13, I just, that just doesn't seem to follow fluidly what with. What I would say is remember the intent that we're trying to protect against children. Mm -hmm. I think we spent a long time on that. Certainly I'm open to your recommendation of a better remedy if, if you have it. But sooner or later you have to set the bar somewhere yeah, at an age and say that if you commit against that child's will, him or her, sure. it, it, under the age of 14, that that is a more serious of, of offense than if it was here. Now, if that's 12 or 11, I don't know, you, you, sooner or later you have to just say, this is the age. Yeah. And it's, at the end of the day, I, it's going to end up looking somewhat arbitrary. I just, I'm trying to kind of follow the, the adult cases down through the ages, you know, offense against a 16, 15, 14-year-old, it's 1 to 20. The 13-year-old, it just seems like a big jump from 1 to 20 to, tw to 25 to 50. But that literally could be, and I'm not trying to be trivial, but it literally could be the course of a month of age that triggers this, this, this difference. It just doesn't seem to kind of flow naturally. Yeah. But if we have any age, that your example will hold true. I know. I just, I'm, I'm just suggesting as we, as we look at the... You know, the other, I guess we could call aggravating circumstances where if someone is a senior citizen, someone is in, um, let's, let's go back to page four. Um, what line? I'm just, <coughs> just kind of looking through this. Uh, top of page four. Yeah. 
if, 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 if there were, no, no, I understand. I'm, I'm just kind of walking through current law. You, you look at five to five to twenty, three to twenty, and I, I don't have the answers. I'm just, I'm just suggesting we're, we're literally going from an offense committed against a 14-year-old of one to twenty to an offense committed against a 13-year-old of 25 to 50. That just seems out of step with the rest of the, with well, the sections. I, I, I think it comes back, and um, the, the things you just pointed out are current law, and there's nothing in here that changes current law. And I'm not suggesting we do. Right. Yeah. But, um, if, if we're, if we're going to say that, that these type of crimes against children are more severe, then the thing you said was, what is a child? And at what age does it become more severe? Yeah. Now, I understand. So, so that's why I was saying, if you say 14 or, or 16 or 13 or 11, sooner or later, once you put that bar in there, then your example holds true. You know, by by one year or one. Sure. And I think clearly, you know, we need to be the minimum sentence needs to be north of these others. We need to be more than three, four. We can dispute, we can discuss that. I think it needs to be higher. Um, than the one to twenty. Oh yeah, and it needs to be higher than the three to twenty that you've got in some of these other you know, this over sixty-five citizen. But I think as we do that, um, you know, you consider the offense, and I'm not minimizing the offense, but it, it is an offense where there's no physical contact. Five to thirty, five. To, I don't know, but it needs to be higher than these others. But twenty-five to fifty just seems just doesn't seem to flow for a for an offense that there's no physical contact. That's all I'm suggesting. Well. I and, and, and I guess that's just a policy thing where you and I would maybe disagree that I, I believe that someone who attempts to rape a person under a child under the age of 14 against their will, um, in my opinion, and, and, and I think the others, the co-sponsors of the bill, would, would argue that deserves a higher rate of punishment. I agree. That, that, that's the sort of the policy state we're know, making with children here now. And I, 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 Mr. Chairman, I'm struggling to how else to answer well, it. I, I, is it not true, just to sure. jump in here a little bit, that, that the offense of aggravated assault has been completed? It's, it's <laughs> that the you're adding, because this one has the added ingredient of the intent to rape. But, but, but this is not simply an attempt at an assault, but the crime of aggravated assault would have been completed for this to uh, apply. Yes. I didn't mean to. Okay. You I finish I just, for now. Uh, I, you, I just wanted to be discussion about this. I, I wasn't okay. comfortable without some discussion about what right now. I think Representative Bearden did have a comment, and Representative Mumford has yielded to his, may have a comment on something you Appreciate Representative Mumford on yielding, and uh, goes to uh, Representative Setzler since you opened this up to committee. Back in 2004, when I was also looking into child predator laws and working with the Louisiana Legislative Council, and their rules was upheld in the Supreme Court of Louisiana, the Supreme Court of the United States. It is up to the legislature to decide that line to watch a child to that point. And Louisiana at that time was 12. Louisiana now has been up to the anything 13 and under for them it's a death penalty on this so it, it's up to us and there's somewhere you got to draw the line and i got to agree with the leader 14 that's a very good place to draw the line but it's up to us to have the debate and we're the ones that make decisions we're the ones that's making the law and that's been upheld Thank so there's no guidelines um now representative mumford um, and then representative everson I wanted to return back to the punishment section where, again, to visit the part where the alleged um, <coughs> child is given the uh, authority in determining whether probation is available. 17, 18. Or the, I guess I would ask. Um, the leader to speak to this, or Mr. Chote, either one, but in my experience, there are often civil suits filed in conjunction with these types of cases. Um, and, of course, the 
settlement negotiations in the civil suits uh, may be going on at similar times, which sort of complicates this this issue. I mean, you know, that's not necessarily a bribe to settle a civil suit. Um, uh, I think the whole area is fraught with peril. I don't like having civil suits involved in criminal cases. I think it's a bad idea until the criminal case is over. Um, but can you see how that might have an impact in this situation that, that might be of some concern? Um, candidly, Representative Mumford, I, I know your background, and I'm just, you know, I don't, I don't have any experience in prosecuting and, and defending those cases, so I, it probably, I, I just don't know how to answer that. The whole thing, and I, I, speaking to having the victim in the process, Actually, that came out of discussions with prosecutors. It was not in the original bill, right? five drafts ago or however many years back. Again, taking input from a lot of sources, trying to mitigate the concerns that are being evidenced here. Uh, certainly, if, if there is a better remedy than all the other people have had input in, if you have it, I am more than open. And I, I said at the beginning of this hearing, I, this is not my bill. And I want to be very careful to say that. This is, uh, the Speaker asked me to carry this bill, and that's what I'm doing. Uh, and I think to date there are 80, almost 90 co-signers on the bill. And so they're, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to carry this issue, if you will, forward. And, and, and I don't know. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm asking you, if there's a remedy to help mitigate or provide that exception, and there's a better idea there without weakening where we're trying to go with the bill, then certainly um, I don't think I or any of the co-sponsors or the speaker or anybody else involved in this process is saying, well, you know, this is the final word, this is it. That, just in the attempt we were trying to get there, and there were some suggestions made. And, um, and, but you, you, you understand what we're saying? And that was, that was one of the thoughts. If, you know, what would your recommendation? I guess that's what I'm saying. Well, I mean, <coughs> you know, I, I don't. Uh, I obviously have a very severe problem when with doing something in this code section or under this law, which I don't think exists anywhere in the law of the state of Georgia or, to my knowledge, in, in any other location in American jurisprudence. And, um, you know. I was one of the first people to set up a victim witness program in the state of Georgia. There is nobody who feels more empathy for victims and wants victims to have input into sentencing uh, than I do. But uh, I don't think that uh, 20 years ago when we were founding the first victim programs and trying to improve the way the district attorney's office delivers services to victims, that we were contemplating that the victim would take the role of the judiciary. So. so from a layman's <coughs> what you're saying is you would just take that out. So the victim would then have no part in the process. I think that the victim no. already has a substantial they still part of the, the process under the code statement. section that Mr. Choke uh, alluded to a few moments okay. ago. But that that part, that input, does not replace uh, a judicial determination. Let's speak to well, the, the court is not required to probate even if the conditions are met. The, the court is simply given the discretion to do that. And once again, the thought was that this is a unique crime, and the victims are uniquely situated in these crimes. They can't be objective about these crimes. This is not... This is not having your mailbox robbed. This is not having your car stolen. Mm -hmm. This is something that you were uniquely involved in. So the idea was that that they should be a part of it and that it would most likely be used as a tool for plea bargaining and negotiations. Right. I, I understand that, that idea. Um, my concern is, though, that uh, the... the uh, crime victims in every case are important and unique. And every case presents uh, particular issues. There's fact issues, there's background issues, there's just a whole panoply of things that 
that need to be considered in, in any criminal case. I mean, I've dealt with literally thousands of victims of crime in my career, and each one of them comes to the courthouse with a, a particular uh, fact pattern and situation, and, and that's where the judiciary's role comes in is to, is to take their input and to hear them and to provide them with justice. But I've never seen a situation where we turn over that role to uh, a party, in, a, in effect, to a, to a suit, which in a sense is what a victim is. Representative Everson. The same section, line 13, the victim consents to, on page 18, Back to the victim consents to a sentence which is less than a mandatory minimum sentence which may be imposed. In the event the victim cannot be located, such facts shall be presented to the court and the victim's consent shall not be required under such circumstances. My question is, normally after a horrendous act such as this, the victim is very much traumatized. Um, did, in your research, did you consider the mental status of the victim when you the line that you just wrote it, and I'm going to let counsel address that basically it's put in there as if the victim's not available for okay. example in the Jessica Lunsford case obviously because she was killed she's, she's not available yes that's the second line but the first line if the victim consents <coughs> the, uh, if I might representative um, if you will look back on page 17, victim is defined. Page 17, page 17 line 20. 20. And I think that in the situation you're yes. describing, if you go down to line 29, the guardian or, or custodian of a crime victim who is a minor or a legally incapacitated person, if in fact the victim was so traumatized that they were not capable of making decisions, and I think the court would appoint a guardian ad litem to represent them. That was the thinking in, in trying to include as many different potential victims, if you will, so that there would be someone. With regard to the second sentence, that was a particular suggestion from the district attorneys, and I think it, it, can, it comes up in the context of, of a, a mother and a child who are living with a, first, a person who turns out to have assaulted the child. Frequently, we're told that the mother and child will leave, just get out of town, so that you've got a crime, you've got someone incarcerated, but you don't have a victim around. And those crimes are still prosecuted. So in that case, if, if, if the district attorney was going to prosecute the crime and, and the district attorney was un, it met the other criteria, then the district attorney wouldn't have to not be able to enter into a plea bargain if he didn't have the victim. And we were we were informed that, and I was surprised, but we were informed that that happens more frequently than I would think, or than that you would have thought. So that's the reason for that particular. Thank you. In there, it was in consultation with the district attorneys. Chairman Bordeaux, to be followed by Chairman Knox. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Following up on what we were just talking about with the definition of victim, does page 17 does that mean that if and I'm referring specifically to how this is drafted does that mean that if the victim is a minor the victim doesn't get to give the consent the minor doesn't get get to give the consent it has to be it falls to his or her parent or guardian or custodian do you understand what I mean I, I'm sorry I was asking counsel a question I wanted to be able to respond sure can, would you again. mind repeating it yes sir on page 17 when we're defining victim and who can give the consent yes sir if the victim, the, the crime victim is a minor, yes, sir. Does that mean that whatever that's called, paragraph C, yes, applies? Sir. Yes, sir. So that it's not the minor who's giving consent; yes, it's 
that minor's parent, guardian, or custodian? Yes, sir, and those definitions came from the Victim Crimes Bill of Rights that's already current law in Georgia. We were trying to create some consistency <coughs> in, 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 in that. Then would it be more clear at the appropriate time to change line 21 to say a person against whom a crime has been perpetrated unless that person is a minor? To clarify that? Well, as I said, we took it out of current law, and we thought that that was clear because it's already in current law and hadn't been questioned, and to my mind has not been been ruled to be. But we can certainly, I mean, that's certainly. Yeah. I, I, I just sort I of understand. Sort that. of belt and suspender sort of thing. Yeah. Right. Okay. But but it's, it's the author's intent that if the victim is a minor, right. it's not the victim who can consent, it's his or her parents right. under C. Right. right. Okay. And I, I would have no problem with that change. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chairman Knox. Uh, <coughs> Chairman, um, one of the things that I, and I know that we're concerned about providing for some discretion in the sentencing of the case, but one thing that concerns me about that, besides the, the issue of whether or not particularly when it's a familial offense rather than stranger offense, is that uh, after good old Uncle Harry has been found guilty of that offense, family members often want to try to short-circuit the process and make sure that Uncle Harry doesn't go away for 25 years. So what happens is the family members then impose on or in bagel the victim, and oftentimes it's a child, to say that they want Uncle Harry only to get this, the alternative sentencing, I guess, in the case. It seems to me that it already happens, but it seems to me that it's in, in victim witness impact statements. And it seems to me that that's putting an awful lot of pressure on a child who's already been subject to this kind of abuse. And then further to put the responsibility on them for deciding, basically, and that's what's required under this code section, deciding whether or not Uncle Harry is going away or Uncle Harry is going to get a pass this time. I'm thinking that's an awful lot to put on a eight-year-old, ten-year-old, eleven-year-old, twelve-year-old, whatever. Um, so I don't know whether, um, Mr. Chairman, whether or not you want to. I, I think that may be uh, this may be a section that could be amenable to amendment, at least on that part of it, as far as the victim's consent is concerned. But I don't know whether the chairman, uh, and maybe you can give us some guidance on this, is it your idea to go go through the whole bill first and then come back and see if we have amendments, or do you want to try to address those as we go through it? I, I, I think I'd like to come back on amendments. Um, I do agree with you that uh, I think we will revisit this section. Um, I don't have anybody else wanting to discuss this section. Before we leave, I'm going to ask Mr. McDade to do something. He, I know he finds it hard to do, and that's to be brief. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to us about the, the, the interplay of the Victim Bill of Rights that this legislature passed a number of years ago in terms of notifying and how you involve a child in the process uh, in, in a case like this? I don't think it would be appropriate to go forward in any case without having a child involved. In fact, most people you can't literally <coughs> prosecute the case unless you have a very close relationship with a child. That child has to trust you. A child has to put on their innocence again in the hands of an the adult they don't know. And if you have a relationship with that child, you understand that child. Yeah, but, but they also don't I, I, I don't mean to cut you off but in the interest of time I, I know what you're saying in terms of trial strategy but I, let's say that uh, there's been a there's going to be a plea here and there's this discussion about uh, uh, first offender or I'm sorry probation 
how does your office interact with the child in terms of their input on a plea? It depends on the age of the child. But if the child is of an age where I think you can have a reasonably appropriate conversation with them. You never try to leave it up to the child to decide what the outcome of the case should be. For that reason, it's reputable not to refer the victim out to the child. Uh, the child often feels pressure. And family members, of course, victimization occurred by family members. <laughs> Oftentimes, mothers are forced to choose between economic support and the perpetrators or defending the child. I prefer a system that doesn't force the child in the process of that <coughs> But we do try to include them, uh, let them know what's going on. Did you? Did you? Did you? Did you? Involved in that. Do you weigh their input? Absolutely. Is, still is it your experience that courts decision. weigh their input? No, we're going to come back to it. Yeah. Vice Chairman Lumpkin. You have a victim impact statement that I think you're required to uh, uh, give to the victim and then is returned to you. Is that correct? Sir. And that victim impact statement, if I'm not mistaken, on I think line 12 or 14 as an area where you can put down a suggested sentence, and it has a specific line regarding whether you want incarceration in the case. Is that correct? For the victim to fill out. The, the victim does have the option to write the state there. Okay. Thank you. Is that done in virtually every felony case of the type that we have under consideration here, there is a victim impact statement. But the parents fill it out for them. And so long as the parent is an appropriate person not involved in litigation in any way, shape, or form, yes. But that's in a large part of the cases not the circumstances. So in, in a case where a parent might be implicated, then you would not have a victim impact statement? It would depend I, on the age of the child. I think the integrity of the statement <coughs> can be impacted dramatically by the spouse or the family member's role in that case. Mm -hmm. You have to be very suspect of it. Representative Abdul Salam. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question uh, follows yours and, and uh, Mr. McDade's comment, and that is what do you do in a situation where even if the child is capable, of, of making a statement and letting the views be known if the parents are guardians refuse to allow them to do so. What what rights do you have to, to, to still get that process? Are you asking? Anybody that can answer. <laughs> <laughs> what a, for, why don't we get a real world perspective from our uh, prosecutor here? It's not unusual for a family member to improperly influence the victim in a child abuse case if it's an improper family abuse case. I personally insist on talking to the child separate from any family member, so long as they're comfortable doing it with me. But it's often the case where they're impacted. But I insist on talking to them, if that's possible, directly. Okay. Mr. Leader, I think we're ready to talk about Section 3. Two down. Rolling right along. Okay, <coughs> when last we visited, all right, section three, page five. Um, basically, this section, and there's some changes from the previous draft, I believe, in the section council, is that correct? No, this is the same. It's this the is, same? This okay, is the same. this is the same as it's been, all right. It, it just, it, as far as kidnapping, <coughs> it changes the sentencing provisions. If the, if the victim is 14 years or older, it's 10 to 20 years. I believe that's current. Is that correct? Right. That's current code. What we're doing again, if the victim is less than 14, and we're going back to that age bar, then then the, we're, we're raising the sentencing or the punishment from 25 to 50. <coughs> Life imprisonment or death if the kidnapping was for ransom of the person kidnapped received bodily injury. That's, that's current. And that's all. That's current code. Would it be fair to say, and I'm not trying to short circuit by any means the discussion here, that sections three and four simply do the same as for those offenses as section two did for aggravated assault, assault with intent to rape? Yes. Based on the age of the child, right? Okay. Anything further you want to say about section three? No, sir. 
Chairman Bordeaux. Thank you, sir. With regard to kidnapping under Section 3 and false imprisonment under Section 4, what's that got to do with sex? Well, I mean, you can kidnap someone and have no, not be a sexual <coughs> predator, not be a sexual offender. None of this has anything to do with sex. Um, if I might. Yes, sir. Um, once again, in, in talking to, to some of the district attorneys, I don't know whether David and I talked about this, but um, you see this type of either kidnapping or um, false imprisonment in conjunction with sex. For example, uh, some of the prior crimes of the fellow who was convicted of killing the woman out at the softball field in, at Emory 10 years ago. His prior convictions had been for uh, false imprisonment and he had taken victims and tied them up in the basement and he had been discovered before he had actually been able to engage in sex with them but they were committed to the fact that that's what in fact the crime was but they this is the crime he gets charged under once again you're simply taking existing law and saying that when you do this to a child under the age of 14 the penalties are going to be severe this is a this is carving out protection for children existing law has not changed the only thing that's changed is if the victim is under a certain age then the penalty is going to be enhanced and we're going to create a presumption uh, that 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 you should be penalized for that um, well doesn't it do more than that though I mean, and, and forgive me again I've been this may not have changed but this is the first time I'm, I'm reading this hasn't changed at all actually. Right. this person's, hasn't changed since the original draft. person's convicted of uh, persons convicted of the offense of kidnapping shall be punished by life if they if the kidnapped person has received a bodily injury. That's new, has nothing to do with sex. Except you, you say in some instances, in many instances, it also involves somebody who's the kidnapper is also going to do something sexual to the victim. That has nothing to do with the age of the victim, though. It's not about a child, it's about whether the victim has been injured in some way. Same thing with uh, number three on line 22. If the person, if, if the victim was kidnapped for a ransom, regardless <coughs> of the age, there's life in prison. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. I see this is broken down. All, all we did was sure. rearrange it to okay. make it more understandable. I'm sorry. It, yes. It's current law. Is there any definition of bodily injury even under current law? There's some case law. I, I would case law. say. Let me also point out that under current sexual registration law, if you are convicted of either of these offenses, you are required to register as a sexual offender. That's been the law for nine years in Georgia. Is that for the reason you stated earlier? That somebody could I, I, I assume I wasn't here in 96 when <laughs> that was passed. So. <laughs> but but, but I, I'm assuming that that was the presumption, uh, And but, but that is a function of current law. But Representative Bordeaux, I, it is my understanding as well that this is all exact current code. All we did is if the victim, once again, is under the age of 14, we move the sentence from 10 to 20 to 25 to 50. Everything else is exactly the way it stands today. In code. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Sessler. I'm going to jump in just briefly, Section 4, because I, I, there's some analogies to the false imprisonment and kidnapping piece, and, it, and, it's, and I think it's written that way intentionally. Um, if you go to page 6, line 1, any person convicted under this code section wherein the victim is not the child of the defendant, and it goes on. Um, as I was reading through this, I just, again, you, you try to think through those, those one-out circumstances where you, know, you, you may have some unintended consequences. Um, I think the provision about child of or the the idea under I think the reason that under false imprisonment it makes a distinction about the child of the defendant. Um, we, we've talked about the reference to 1710 6.2. I'm concerned that if we've got if, if we're targeting sex offenders and we need to draw a beat on them, get, make, make no mistake about that. I'm concerned if you've got cases where uh, parents of children 
under split custody circumstances get involved in kidnapping. Not to condone it. Not to condone it in any way. Um, but we were kind of wargaming with some folks, thinking through some, some circumstances. And I can imagine a circumstance where the mother may be the, they have primary physical custody of the children, and um, dad discovers that you know, mom's boyfriend's using drugs, or there's something really bad going on in the house, and makes a decision to go snatch the kids. He's not doing the right thing. Not doing the right thing under Georgia law, and I'm not suggesting we condone that. But I think to to extend a 25 to 50 year mandatory minimum for dad grabbing his kids, taking them away from the house. Maybe I'm misunderstanding the question. But I believe what line uh, one through three says on page six is exactly what you're saying. Right. It, it's saying that, and the victim is not the child of the victim for the exact reasons you're. Out. Exactly. So we take that back to section three for kidnapping. It does that language doesn't apply to kidnapping. That, that's my concern. It's it's car, it's carved out that way under, and it might just be an oversight. Um, you can kidnap you see, it's child. under false imprisonment, but not under kidnapping. Yeah. If you kidnap your own child, you go to prison. Right. right. And that may be an oversight. I mean, with the size of this budget, it's something that, that caught my eye as I was reading through section four. Um, Part of Part of the confusion here may be that we were trying to mirror the current sexual registry law, and this language is in that law. Sure. And it may have been. We were trying to keep. We were trying to keep things as consistent as we could with where they are. You know, once again, the concept is that to 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 take current law and simply look at an enhanced penalty for children who are victims. Understand. And references to these particular code sections came from an analysis of the current sexual review registry, which in some cases was fairly vague. It didn't, there was no people, there was no, there are no citations in current law to code sections. There are simply statements, if this happens, if this happens, if this happens. So what we were trying to do was, and if you look in the new revised sexual registry list, rather than simply making statements, we've tried to list code sections to, to be more precise. So this is really an effort to, to take existing law and make it more precise and tie it to what the crimes in Georgia are as opposed to just a, a vague definition, which is what current law has. So, so, and I, I would just offer that. I know this isn't the appropriate time to, to address that, but as we come back through and are, and are entertaining potential amendments, I would recommend that we consider that is not the child of under Section 3 kidnapping, and possibly consider um, is not the child or legal ward of. Um, I don't know if there are cases where um, someone other than the parent but that might be the legal guardian um, could get caught up in this, and we, and we can kick that around. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, too. I do have one other. Mr. Chairman, I do have one other, um, one other point I'd like to make that, or at least discuss that I think addresses Representative Bordeaux's concern. Um, on page 5, lines 26 and 27, where we invoke the um, current sexual offender treatment under current code. Um, and I think addressing the concern with parents snatching kids or, or a less, a non-directly sexually related kidnapping, um, uh, older sibling or, or friend, y you name it, um, where we have a provision there that says any person convicted under code section in addition subject to provisions if a previous sex offender or there's intent to commit sexual con intent to commit um, criminal sexual conduct that we tie that to some sexual conduct piece um, it already is in current law representative <laughs> and that's in the sexual registry law which also accepts Kidnapping by someone who is not a who, who is the parent. If you kidnap your child currently, you will be you, a non-custodial parent can kidnap the child, but you will not have to register as a sex offender if you do it. But if you kidnap a child who is not your parent, current law requires that you register as a sex offender. Say that again, please. You know, I didn't write that, and <laughs> I'm happy I didn't. But would you repeat it, please? Yeah. Under current law, if if you are convicted of kidnapping, 
you have to register as a sex offender unless the child you kidnapped is yours. Then you don't have to register as a sex offender. So they which make I, the exception here that we're not making. The exception is in the sexual review registry, and there's no requirement in the in Section 3 dealing with kidnapping that you be subject to the sexual registry. This is just kidnapping. So there's no there's no implication in kidnapping that 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 it's per se sexual. It, but if 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 you are, I, I think Mr. if I may, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Setzler's point, and I think it was a good point, was why do you carve out the exception for false imprisonment, or if you do it to your own child, but you don't carve out the exception for kidnapping? Because if you do it to your own child? Be, because the current sexual registry law created a carve-out for kidnapping, but it didn't create a carve-out for false imprisonment. So we left it like it was with regard to kidnapping and put the carve-out in, in um, false imprisonment, so now we have a carve-out in both. It's just in two different places. So two wrongs make. I don't no, think there, no, no. no, I think it's just two ways to do th the, the right thing. I don't think there'd be a problem to take and put, except for a parent, in the kidnapping statute. It would just be a redundancy in the code. But that's what we're asking. It's already in the code, but if you want it in there, it would just be a redundancy. And the reason we put it in the... Is that right, Vincent? Uh, I think it was oversight. Oh, okay. I think we... <laughs> we were wrong. <laughs> well... Never overlooked the possibility we may have made a no, mistake earlier. No, I don't. <laughs> Where are you going to be working next week? <laughs> so I think we probably should put that in Well, except that we're, that would, uh, I don't think it makes a difference insofar as the punishment because we haven't, we haven't changed, we haven't created any sexual registry exposure in either one of these crimes. That's created in the sexual registry. Mr. Chairman, if I could follow up, Mr. Chairman, it's, it's related, just to. So, 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 so just, just to summarize, um, and there may need to be some wordsmithing beyond just specific sections, but I think as a policy statement, I'd like to explore uh, a carve-out for parents or legal guardians under kidnapping and under false imprisonment. I know it exists under false imprisonment. Um, and I'd like to consider, this is a separate issue, but it's something that I wanted to make a point of. Um, that this, just so I'm trying to okay. make notes. You want it to be okay for parents and legal guardians to kidnap and to false No, no, I, just, I don't want parents and legal guardians to get the 25 to 50 for kidnapping a child under the age. I'm, I'm sure somewhere in the code there's some treatment of kidnapping for parents. Okay, it just, so, so that the punishment doesn't apply to them. Right, yeah. For both crimes. And I think that would apply for children under the age of 14 and potentially children over 14. So we need to be careful where we put that in the code so it doesn't just apply to kids under 14. But that being said, there's a second piece um, that I think as we look at kidnapping, we look at false imprisonment, I think we need to explore and discuss the possibility of tying that to um, an intent to commit uh, criminal sexual conduct. Um, I can envision a sibling or someone kidnapping a kid, potentially same sex, for very different reasons. It could be a gang kidnapping. Um, and I'm not suggesting that's not, not, not a big deal. I'm just I'm thinking through um, different crimes that aren't of the sexual nature that might not lead to registry for a series of four or five males that kidnap another male for a period of 24, 48 hours. I'm just suggesting that might be something we explore. You know, I, 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 there, there's another guy we, we, we take we, as as an outgrowth of a fight, we grab him and drive off with him, and it's called, quote, kidnapping, but there's nothing of the sexual nature. There's no credible intent to commit criminal sexual conduct that, yeah, we slam him as felons potentially, but that it wouldn't necessarily lead to the sex offender treatment. Well, that would be life imprisonment under this bill anyway. Okay. Under current law. Well, and again, um, I'm not suggesting that there, there shouldn't be a, diff, a stiff crime for them, but I think in cases where that could be probated or in cases where they might serve something less than a full life sentence, sexual offender treatment, I think, needs to certainly go with sexual deviancy, not a group of unruly males doing unruly things to other males that aren't sexually related. Well, just, just so I can make sure I understand and to let you know that 
it's under current law, kidnapping is one of the seven deadly sins. Mm -hmm. And so if you're convicted of kidnapping, regardless of who you are, you there is no probation, there is no first offender treatment, there's minimum mandatory. Sure. So, and, all, and all we have done is created a minimum a minimum mandatory all, all, all we've actually done is raise the minimum mandatory from 10 to 25 years. That's the only effect of the change in the kidnapping. Yeah. For children under 14, what I'm suggesting is if two 18-year-olds kidnap a 16-year-old, drive off with them, they get convicted, get sentenced to 10 years, they do 10 years hard time. When they get out of prison, that if it wasn't a sexually related offense, they not be tagged sex offender for life at age 28 because they they can, can committed a gang crime at age 18. Well, that's been the law in Georgia for 10 years. We would have to change. We would have to change what the law on sexual registration has been for 10 years, and I think that that once again, the provisions of the current law that we've incorporated in this law, are required by some of the federal laws, uh, in order for us to get matching funds under federal grants. So the current law and the things we've kept in the current law are in large part dictated by what federal law is, and this is one of them. But I don't know, and if if it's not the case that every case of kidnapping or false imprisonment is required under federal law to lead to sex offender registry. If that's not required, then I would suggest we at least contemplate, unless there's intent to commit criminal sexual conduct in the offense, that the person could potentially not have treatment as a sex offender. for That's all I'm suggesting. Well, once again, it's, a, it's kidnapping of a minor, and that's, that's where the sex offender registration comes into play. If it's a minor, except by a parent, then in addition to everything else, the sex offender registry comes into play. And candidly, under current Georgia law, registration on the sex offender registry is the least of all the punishments that someone convicted of kidnapping gets. And, and Mr. Chair, I'm just saying. Even, even if they're a minor. I'm just saying. Is it, 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 I mean, so I understand it. I had to excuse myself, but that, that is current code. Is that correct? It is. That's currently the law. That's currently the law. And all I'm suggesting is is that kidnapping by 15-year-olds of a 13-year-old here would trigger Senate Bill 440, 10-year mandatory minimum. But when those 15-year-olds are tried, sentenced to 10 years, do their time, if that kidnapping wasn't sexually related, then we ought to consider having them not registered for life just because they're caught up in this provision. That's all I'm suggesting. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Sessler. Um, Vice Chairman Mumford and then Chairman Knox. Um, <coughs> Leader, I've got a. Most of my questions are, as we go through these sections, are going to be similar, basically because I, I want to make sure that I understand absolutely what the law is now and what we're going to. And I know that we've just covered some of this ground, but if everybody will just bear with me just a minute. Um, it's my understanding that kidnapping currently carries 10 to 20 years, and that um, there is no parole for the first 10 years because it's seven deadly sin. Correct. I'm going to yield it. Legislative Council. I believe that's a true state. And I, I would also persons between the ages of 13 and 17 years of age charged under this statute are subject to being tried as adults Correct. and subjected to uh, that 10-year mandatory minimum. Correct. Yes. And I think they're subject to that at the discretion of the district attorney. Is that correct? If it speaks to current law, I would yield the counsel on that. Um, kidnapping is not in 151128. Well, so what's the answer? My question is... Kidnapping can't be... A 13-year-old uh, would be a designated citizen. It would not be your court jurisdiction. Okay. So it's not one of the seven deadly sins? <coughs> yes. Kidnapping it's, is not, it's a, seven not a seven deadly in terms of You know, we get these terms confused. Yeah. For both. Could you elucidate? Uh, murder, voluntary manslaughter, rape, aggravated sodomy, aggravated trauma molestation, aggravated sexual battery, or armed robbery. Right. Okay, so that's why I think it's good to go through these mm -hmm. things. So, kidnapping, if you're between the ages of 13 and 17 years of age currently, is not a designated felony, and you could be prosecuted in juvenile court, protected in juvenile court. It is a designated felony. It's not a 440. Right. It's a probable, <laughs> uh, no less than two-year incarceration. Or... I'm sorry, I didn't hear your response. Yes, that's correct. 
All right, and I guess direct coming back to Mr. Choate, then the changes that we made did not change that. A juvenile who commits the offense of kidnapping still has that protection. Yes, sir. And he would, would he have that protection even if the victim is under 14 years of age? I believe he would. But he would not have the protection from being required to register and have an electronic monitoring device for the rest of his natural <laughs> life. No, no, I, I don't. Once again, the the kidnapping of a minor comes under the current law with regard to sexual registration. What we would do with that minor is that he would be reviewed. Now, if it was handled in the juvenile system, the sexual review, the sexual review law doesn't apply. Okay. If he gets handled in the juvenile system, he's in the juvenile system. Okay. But if he's not handled in the juvenile system, then he would be, uh, he would be like every other person convicted, <coughs> contemplated under this bill. He would be reviewed by the board, and if he was found to be a predator at the age 15, and we're informed there are some, then in fact when he was probated or when he got out of prison or when he got out of jail, he'd wear a monitor the rest of his life because the experts at the review board had determined that there was a high level of recidivism. All right, and I'll, I'll give this next question to either either one of you who can answer. Then the uh, how does the how do, how does the, is there any possibility of a child between the ages of 13 and 17 being prosecuted as an adult for kidnapping <coughs> they will go to juvenile court and they will be treated under the designated felony act is that is that the law Well, that's a law question to me. <laughs> Meaning that the district attorney can ask to have it transferred to the Superior no, Court? Exclusive jurisdiction of juvenile court. Cannot go to Superior Court. That's correct. All right. Um, <laughs> someone in the back shaking their head, suggesting oh, it can. I had a case transfer, a kidnapping transfer to Superior Court. They can transfer. In any case, they choose to, they can bring an indictment on the agent's outlook. But the exclusive jurisdiction is just on most that she lives in. Thank you. So it's subject to being transferred at the discretion of the district attorney? Yeah. Well, I think that's correct. That's what I think. Is there, is there any aversion to carving out some sort of protection for juveniles between the ages of 13 and 17 that would prevent them from being subjected to this statute? Under the kidnapping? Under kidnapping, and I guess I, we're actually talking, as I understand it, we're actually talking about it doesn't matter whether they're under 14 or over, other, except that the under 14 would have the enhanced, the extra enhanced sentence, but uh, that is a, <coughs> if I can try to restate the question. <laughs> Please do, because I'm not sure I understand it. That's, I, I, I have to admit, I have, I struggle with this the daily. Que the, the question is, is there, is there an objection to creating an ex the exclusive <coughs> jurisdiction for a 13 through 17 year old who kidnaps in the juvenile court, I, which, not, would, which would exempt them from anything but juvenile punishment and exempt them from registration from the sexual review. You know, I, I hear what you're saying. That's really, I don't think, what I'm, I'm asking. I'm, what I'm at, I don't care how it's done. In other words, it doesn't have to be carved out as some exception. I don't think we need to necessarily do away with the law that we currently have, I'm just wondering is there some way to save individuals in that age range or in some age range from this penalty? Well, the answer is yes, because the legislature has exclusive authority to do that. Well, where would we so, do it? Well, in this, at kid, in kidnapping. Um, I, 
I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't thought about that. But I will tell you this, the one thing that does come to my mind, and I mentioned it earlier, the kidnapping of a minor, regardless of whether it's by another minor, if it in fact is kidnapping, is required to be in the sexual registry. Right. And um, we, have, we have said in our rewrite of the bill that if you're dealt with as a juvenile, then you won't be dealt with under here. And that's back in the back under the registry exactly. provision. Exactly. Now, I have to say, I, I think there's a, a modicum of risk there because I'm, I haven't, I'm not sure whether that would put us out of compliance with federal law because the, as I understand, <coughs> that law was enacted in 96 because of the Jacob Wetterling Act. And because of the Jacob Wetterling Act, and if we, if, when Georgia enacted the, that crime, that gave us matching funds to do things, actually to build a sexual registry, to have a sexual review board. And it's brought a lot of, you know, whether that would impact that, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't think it will the way it is now, but I, I'm, I'm not sure. But, I mean, I think the general answer is with regard to, to how you're going to treat juveniles, which is juvenile defendants, juveniles who commit this crime. Um, it had been my understanding, and I'm, I'm not a juvenile law expert, it had been my understanding that that was somewhat discretionary with the district attorney and that in criminal cases, the criminal <coughs> defense attorney would, if, if, if the crime were brought in superior court, could in fact make a motion to transfer in an appropriate case it would go down to the juvenile system. And our thought was that that shouldn't be covered by, um, by the sexual registry provisions of the bill. But if they're not and they're, and they're handled in superior court, under current law, they're subject to the sexual registry. Current to the minimum, they're, they're subject to the minimum mandatory. There's no first offender treatment. That's current law. So I think that the issue revolves around who gets jurisdiction over a juvenile who commits this crime. Okay, just to follow up on my question. Just trying to pinpoint where we would go to right. fix it. Right. It's complicated, isn't it? Um, include this. This does include parents, as we've already covered. And my next question revolves on sections uh, three and four. Isn't hasn't case law declared kidnapping um, not to carry the death penalty unless? I mean, isn't the isn't the provision here where it says death has actually been declared unconstitutional? Was that is some case called Furman versus Georgia or? <coughs> this is current law. We haven't we haven't Coker versus Georgia. We haven't changed the law here at all. I understand that. I just want to point out, though, that where it says death in here, and under three and four, both of those have, are unconstitutional. Is that correct? I'm not familiar with that case. You're not familiar with that case? Okay. Um, my final question is uh, where we're talking about 1710 and C on line 26, 17-10-6.1 and 17-10-7. Those are the registration requirements. Is that what those are? I'm sorry. What, uh, was line 27. I just want to make sure I understand exactly. No, no, no. 1710-6.1 is current law, and that's the minimum mandatory for the seven day sentence. Okay, so that's... We, this is current law. We, we haven't changed that at all. So the 1710-6.1 is the, the me minimum 10-year mandatory, yes. and the 17-10-7 is the reporting requirement? No, no, no. That has... The registration requirement? Recidivist. <coughs> that's the recidivist statute. It's current law. Okay. Section right. three. Where is the where's the part about? So is there? A, where's the reporting requirement come in? Because when you get back into the, it, it's in the sexual registry. Gotcha. Then. And it's only kidnapping of a minor by someone except a parent. Six point two. So every kidnapping is not going to be subject. To this. <coughs> if if okay. a thirty year old kidnaps a twenty five year old, it'll be subject to this section in seventeen ten six point one, but it won't be subject to forty two one twelve. Man, I appreciate you bearing with me, but I find this extremely confusing. Thank you. Good. Good. Chairman Knox, followed by Representative Abdul Salam. Just for clarification, I think this is going to, I should address this to the Legislative Council, unless y'all. Um, I have, I don't know if I've ever even done a kidnapping case before or not, but one of the things I think I understand about it, and just looking at this, at the, at the definition, Bear with me. I'm not going to try to change current law, but is there a, is there a precedent with respect to what constant what what the, the, the elements of this crime are? Escortation. Escortation. 
Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see if I'm. Uh, uh, help me with this. What if What if Grandma's watching the kids? Dad calls up and says, "I'm going to come over and pick them up. It's my time to have them. You know, her six months are up, and I'm going to. I want to take my custody now. I'm going to be over there in 20 minutes. And Grandma's doesn't know where Mom <laughs> is. You know, the rat, they're all gone somewhere. She takes the child." goes over into the next room, closes the door, and hides the child in the room. Dad shows up and says, he's not here. Not here. Under this definition, unless there's case law to the contrary, isn't that kidnapping? Doesn't that contain the elements of a crime for kidnapping? Of kidnapping? It's against the child's will. She doesn't have a legal right to hide the child from the father. And she's moved that child from one place to another. Doesn't say you have to go across the state line or to another country. It just says you have to move them. Doesn't say how far. Did, did the mom give permission for her to I don't know that. This, I, that's the only elements I've got. I mean, that's the only facts I have in the case. Does it make a difference whether she does or doesn't? She have the lawful authority to hide the child from the father who is entitled to have custody at that time. Whether the mom, mom can't give her authority to violate a court order. That would be a domestic issue, I think, as opposed to a criminal. Well, it would be a domestic issue, but it's also a crime if it constitutes kidnapping. If it has the elements of the crime of kidnapping. And and she she can't, even if mom left the children with grandma and said, Grandma, you take care of these kids and I'll be back in six months or whatever. Uh, if she then, if, if those six months are up, dad's now got custody under a court order saying, you know, June the 1st, you know, it's your turn to have the child. And he doesn't, and he comes over to get the child and grandma hides the child. She's violating the court's order and she doesn't have lawful authority to do that after the period of time for which she is, that she's been granted that authority by the person who had, who had the authority to grant it. I believe, that, that, I believe that's contemptible but not criminal. I think it's both. I think it's both. Well, because I think then you've got a family, you've got the parent. That's so. That's the cutout on this, isn't it? That's not cut out on here. What point are you getting to? Well, my point is that you put grandma in the position of having to face a sentence of 25 years for. Uh, for kidnapping or for imprisonment, either one, because she put the child in the room, shut her up in there, and not going to let her out till dad's gone. Doesn't say how long she has to be in there. It doesn't say how long she has to, far she has to move her. Doesn't have to be any violence done. It just has to be done. And it has to be against the will of the child, I guess, and that's a factual issue. Correct, Are you are you nodding agreement? I'm nodding in agreement. Okay. Well, they don't know anything. They don't know anything about this. You know that they don't know anything. Well, I guess my question is, my point is, do we have do we have any? Does this exacerbate that problem by by uh, enhancing the without having some better definition of what constitutes kidnapping? I don't, what I'm saying is, it's not it's not a very good definition of kidnapping. I don't think it's. And I'm surprised that it hasn't been challenged and overturned. It seems to me really vague as far as the statute is concerned on the definition of kidnapping. Yeah, well, I'm saying, does this, my question is, does this exacerbate that the problem of vagueness in the law in that it allows for uh, uh, things to be prosecuted that may not be, we're not looking at as crime. We don't really want somebody who's just picked a child up and moved them, and, you know, it's, a, and it's basically a custody dispute, but it's also a criminal offense if they do it under, the, under that scenario that I just outlined. All it does is change the penalty. I understand that. But I think it makes it that's a uh, that that enhancement could uh, makes this a, a more of a prop makes it more problematical I think from both prosecution and defense standpoint uh, when it's 25 years as opposed to 10 years and we're talking about mandatory minimums on you know grandma's just trying to help the child you know.
But she could get prosecuted under that scenario. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Representative Abdul Salam. My, my question goes back um, to the previous discussion to uh, Representative Knox. Um, what, is, what is the distinction, I guess Mr. Chokes or, or Legislative Council might answer, what is the distinction when you say kidnap of a minor and as opposed to it being a victim under 14? What what is what is that? Um, you know, if if it's a minor and it's not on the fourteen, then what happens? So so the only difference would be just in, in terms of, of the length of incarceration. But a minor would still be considered a minor as it currently is. Yes. You're not changing. Thank you. Anyone else on that section? Let me ask this question. Do um, we sort of talked about three and four together? Is it, does the committee feel comfortable with our discussion on section four, or do we need to have a specific discussion about that section now? Chairman I, Bordeaux. Mr. Chairman, I don't want to belabor the issue, but I, I do want to make sure that I understand what the crime of false imprisonment is. It's something I seldom see prosecuted. I see it as a tort, certainly, but maybe if we could just talk very briefly about what the crime of false imprisonment entails, what it's all about. We do have it. It's, a, it's effective. Sure. Um, did you want to hear the author? Uh, or, or Mr. Cho? Yeah. Uh, well, before I, I do that, or, or <laughs> well, before I do that, let me recognize uh, did you have. Something, Chairman Knox? Oh, just on this section four. Okay. The, yeah, I just want right, to add. So we haven't addressed it before, so it's we'll, not. Well, we, we, it sort of overlapped with three, yeah. okay. so we're, we're going to now take it up. I, I, I believe that the elements of the crime are on page five at lines 32 through 35, and based upon my memory of tort law, um, they mirror the, the elements in tort law, and like many crimes, there's a corresponding civil right where there's also a crime. It, but it is essentially a violation of the personal liberty, liberty of another without legal authority. Um, I, I think it is. Uh, the idea was that, <clears throat> number one, it's mentioned. Once again, I go back to the sexual registry law, which we have in place right now. And if you falsely imprison a minor, if you falsely imprison a minor, except if you're the parent, which sounds to me like an oxymoron, but if you if you falsely imprison a minor, then you are subject to the sexual review registry. Is the, is the basic difference between kidnapping and false imprisonment is that with kidnapping, there has to be an aspiration I of, think of so. moving, and with kidnapping, it's got to be against the will of the person. Yes. So if I just, <coughs> I guess... I find think you in a room without legal authority. That and, would, and I've I, not moved you, and you, even though you've not objected, I've, I'm guilty of false imprisonment. I, I think if I were going to put Representative Knox's example in a cubbyhole, that's the one I'd put it in, as opposed to kidnapping. Okay. Now, notwithstanding the fact that the child was moved from one room to another, I, I think that's a, you know, not a cognizable distinction. But I think that. That, that if you were going to say there was a crime there, that grandmother committed a crime, that it would be if a false imprisonment. If a security guard at a store thinks he's got a shoplifter and tells that shoplifter, to, uh, the alleged shoplifter, to sit down in this room, I want to question you, that could be false imprisonment if, if he's acting without legal authority. I think that's the context that, I'm, uh, that I see it most in the, in the advance sheets of the reports, yeah. Okay. And if, so if that store security guard does it to 
13 year old lead shoplifter, he could be subject to the sentencing uh, punishment provisions of 1710.6.2 under the new language. That's right. All right. Thank you. Actually, I, I was going to raise sort of the same issue about that. And I'm on. Oh, I'm sorry. I think it is on. Um, I was going to raise the same issue, but with respect to law enforcement, often not. Yeah, I'll say often. I'm not sure how often, but oftentimes, there's an, it, when they are, when they pick up juveniles, there's a question about whether they know that they're juveniles at the time or whether they'll even say that they're juveniles. And I've seen cases where they hold them in jail, and all of a sudden they figure out, oh, crime! This person's only 15. We forgot to ask. Oops. Are they subject to this? Are they subject to? Would that law enforcement officer be subject to this code section then, and be subject to? Well, I think it, it would devolve around whether they held the person there under "quote unquote" legal authority, and, and certainly they would be acting under legal authority, whether they acted properly. I, I'm not familiar with the law you're talking about in the juvenile. Well, I'll think about it some more. <laughs> You're talking to practice more than mm. Once again, exactly. Chairman Knox, um, the, a lot of these other code sections were visited and incorporated because they had been incorporated not directly by reference to the code section, but by general reference to a crime called against a minor by someone not a parent. So what we're trying to do is connect those to, to our code and make sure that we were, we, we, when you looked in one law, you knew what the other law was. And we were trying to be consistent by, by, by drawing somewhat of a bright line with regard to punishment at below the age of 14, <coughs> determining that that's when, th th those are children. And those are, even, even though you can be older than that and still be a minor, those are children and children are deserving of special protection. And those who would harm children should be put on notice that the penalty is exacerbated. If you deal with what the policy decision about what a child is, then you incur the wrath of the state. Okay. Section four, final questions. Okay, here's where we are. Um, we have been going now for about two hours and 45 minutes, and I have been made aware and in the spirit of this committee on a bipartisan basis that there are other meetings uh, scheduled for, for later. Um, so we're going to adjourn this meeting or recess this meeting now. It would be my preference to, to come back tomorrow uh, and continue. However, tomorrow is in effect due to our adjournment schedule a Friday. And I know many people have plans to leave when the session is over tomorrow. So what we're going to do is reschedule beginning with Section 5 on Tuesday afternoon. I'm not certain now the time, but I want to do it at a time that we can find a substantial block of time. Um, and everybody will obviously be notified of when that will be. And, and, and it will probably not be in this room because I know that the... Uh, the Secondary Judiciary Committee uh, will be meeting at uh, the same time. We call it the Little Judiciary. Judy <laughs> White. Um, and um, <laughs> so, so thought that we might get trouble. So, in the words of the old country song, somebody's going to have to leave here. Um, Chairman, this has been a good. Right. So, do you think it would be possible, and I'll ask 
Chief of Staff to the Speaker and the Leader to possibly even start shortly after noon. I'm, I'm hopeful that I'll be in much better physical condition. We do too. And uh, I, I appreciate the committee's. Get a big room. <laughs> no, yes. Tuesday. At your discretion. Next Tuesday. But get a big room so that the press has here. a place to it's sit. It's been a good discussion today, and I want to thank the leader and Mr. Cho. So the press has a place to sit. We thank you very much. We stand adjourned until uh, further call.